Hi everyone. Hello. How are y'all? Doing good. Welcome to the show. Special birthday show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy birthday to Alex, our co-host. Um, Alex, do you want to talk about how old you are today or should we not mention ages? Oh, it's okay. I'm 30, y'all. We made it. It seems like it seems like a big deal to be 30, right? I just want to know what, is it really? what have you learned now that you're 30? Not a thing. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. Uh, I think the only difference is I just care a lot less about what people think, and that's good. I mean, I didn't really care before, but now it's like, like 10 steps below that. So, but other I think than that's that, the consistent thing with getting older, for sure. Yeah, I don't think um, it makes much of a difference. Uh, we're not going to make a big discussion about, like, you know, theoretical stuff around the ideas of decades and 30, but I don't really think, think it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Other than, like, slowly feeling your body, like, deteriorate as time goes on, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, you know, I feel like you're constantly writing about your body, so it's good to be aware of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll go with that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, yeah, it's, I'm really happy that we could celebrate your birthday in this way. Um, you could be doing whatever you wanted. And this is one of the things that you wanted to do. So we're really happy to be spending this time with you. Um, yeah. I feel like I, I wanted to say that um, I've known you for probably, I think I've known you for like five or six years now, maybe four years, something like that. Um, and it seems, it seems like as you get older, it's actually really hard to keep a lot of friendships and, um, yeah, I'm really happy that I've been able to, um, see you grow in, you know, multiple different ways and, um, see your work impact the world and stuff. Um, so, <laughs> so thanks for being my friend, Alex. I'm just a bit embarrassed. In the mind right now, basically, is what it's like. I was, too nice. <laughs> That's what, I was afraid of y'all putting this in the beginning because I was like, I'm gonna cry and then I'm gonna be like on the whole show. show you and cry. we love vulnerability. <laughs> yeah, we whatever. You, vulnerability is strength. <laughs> I love y'all. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, how yeah, are you feeling? After that, I'm all right. Yeah, Paige, you want to fawn over me now? It's your turn. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, every I can just say how every conversation I learned so much from you, <laughs> and yeah, it's just been a pleasure knowing and hanging out and getting to talk about such a wide spectrum of things. Now, y'all are great. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I'm just being serious. Yeah, I know oh. we have to, I mean, we have to celebrate our, you know, some of the best among us. And you're definitely one of those people, Alex. So yeah, thank it's, you. just got to take it. It's your birthday. Oh, um, cool. <laughs> but, yeah, let's get to the guests. I'm getting uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. So, so today we're really excited for the show because, um, we had a reading group years ago. Um, the Future Left had a reading group years ago um, using the book called Platform Capitalism by Nick Chernyshek. And um, uh, when we when we had that that um, book club, I learned about this essay by this person named Michael Siciliano, um, who is now a guest today, um, who is writing about similar things around the same time period. Um, and to me, the concept is really new. Um, mm -hmm. It's still it's still a pretty ripe concept. Um, but Michael was writing about this back when, you know, it was first starting to be introduced. Um, and he was writing about it from a sociological perspective. And um, also Michael was um, in dialogue partially with the future left at the time as well. And I believe Michael came to the reading group. I believe my memory is really. Oh, bad, I don't remember that. That was like five years ago or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe Michael can clarify later. But um, we did um, 
circle. I was in conversation with him at the time, at least about um, some of his work he was doing. And now it's accumulated to this point of producing a book that we're really happy to um, uh, have uh, now to talk about. And also um, we, we had someone on the show a couple weeks ago who I've been following personally um, whose who's music and um, writing I've been following for a while um, is a friend of Alex and was at a, actually was at a festival with Paige and you know has a lot of different ties with us you know um, and is a part of the same community as well and was also writing about platform capitalism of music so we as um, all of us as people who um, have been thinking about this for a while are really excited to see how this conversation is changing and it's becoming more specific and it's starting to be geared around music and culture. And um, we all know at this point that all of culture has been transformed, not just by the digital, but by the, the platform and digital economy. Um, so we're gonna have Paige introduce our guests. Um, so go ahead, Paige. Yeah. And I just want to say we will be explaining platform capitalism in depth uh, later in the show. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to all of that. Um, so we are super excited to have our wonderful guests joining us tonight. We have DeForest Brown Jr., who is an ex-American theorist, journalist, and curator. He produces digital audio and extended media, such as speaker music, and is a representative of Make Techno Black Again campaign. His work explores the links between the Black experience in industrialized labor systems and Black innovation in electronic music. On Juneteenth of 2020, he released the album Black Nationalist Sonic Weaponry on Planet Moo. Primary Information will publish his first book, Assembling a Black Counterculture, in 2021. And we'll be linking all of these at the end of the show as well. And then we also have Michael Siciliano, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Queen's University. His research addresses theoretical issues related to power, technology, and the future of work. We'll be talking about his book, Creative Control, which explore these issues through ethnographic studies of music production and YouTube content production in the United States. So a lot to talk about tonight. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Paige. Mm -hmm. so we're gonna welcome uh, DeForest now um, from backstage, the digital backstage. Mm -hmm. And so welcome DeForest, how are you doing? Oh, you're muted, hon. Come off, come off oh. of that. <laughs> oh no, I, I <laughs> muted you, you're good. you're good. Excellent, no, I'm all right, how are you? We're doing dead. Um, so in your in your article, uh, you say, at present, artists and copyrights are indentured and intertwined assets in a music industrial complex that no one has any intention of fixing. And that is quite mm -hmm. the quote. And I was wondering if you could elaborate and just bring everybody up to speed with what your report is about. Yeah, I mean, for the last, I'll say 10 years or so, I've been somewhere between like a music journalist, I guess some kind of PR, like industry plug, and um, I guess more recently electronic musician. Um, and then I guess in my own way, kind of behind the scenes, like rhythm, rhythm analytic, like spy, um, taking notes on <laughs> various like points of distribution throughout the music industry. Um, and yeah, one of the things I noticed, like when I started writing about music in 2010 was that it was around the same time that the Love Parade and the Second Summer of Love was kind of having their 20 year anniversary. There was like a Vice like ID article about it. And like, I mean, I guess there was a book like Dirk Klong Familiae about, that was like the oral history of like Berlin techno and such. And with that like sort of, how should I put it? I guess uh, revital revitalization of this like multi-million dollar like industry that it kind of like um taken hold of europe and parts of america in the 90s there was also kind of like the edm boom that was kind of coming up in america and also like getting ready to pop as like the financial bubble popped i guess from between like 2008 and 10. um 
so yeah, I started writing about music around that time and noticed that all of my favorite blogs were, uh, actually I should say it this way. I started my first internship at Accelerator, this like electronic music magazine um, that was on, I believe it was Fifth Avenue, Fifth Avenue in like Midtown. And I didn't realize that it was owned by Spin Magazine at the time. And Stereo Gum, Gorilla vs. Bear, Vibe, like all these magazines were all kind of like shoved into a single side of the office while the Spin staff had like two floors with like coffee machines and cereal makers and, and whatnot. And yeah, I don't know. While working at these publications, I just kind of got the sense that as conglomerate or as companies were buying other blogs and smaller blogs and kind of hiring people like me to do like freelance writing that what was happening was that these websites were kind of regurgitating um, copyrights, regurgitating artists that like Radiohead, like anytime you need like a website needs clicks, they post about Kanye. That's like a general rule throughout like, like magazines um, over the last 10 years, or if you need some clicks, like, I don't know, throw up like an old like Miles Davis like reissue and you're guaranteed to get like a hundred clicks and like a bunch of buys. And I mean, as people have started kind of relying more on streaming services and online websites to discover music, which is a term that was kind of coined to, I guess, define this like weird click buy kind of dopamine kick Pavlovian, uh, wealth extraction buffer system that the music industry has kind of uh, built. But I don't know, it's, yeah. <laughs> That's like a whole lot, but yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you to like, just like setting up, um, kind of setting up the framework for where, where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that you, what you just touched upon was that you were working um, during the blog era and um, basically you were, you were part of this, the DIY corporatization period, right? Where yeah. the DIY was starting to become intertwined with um, uh, corporate America. And I know in your, 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 your article, you referenced this and re referenced in, in, um, in regard to uh, Toffler. Um, I believe you say, um, I believe, yeah, you say that we are going through that again, this, 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 the shock of the corporate identity crisis. So it seems like, would you agree that this is something we have gone through circularly um, and that we continue to go through? Is that something, I'm wondering if we can connect your previous experience with mm -hmm. what the future is developing for us, right? Yeah, that's actually kind of been the crazy thing about my moving to New York from Alabama to get into all of this was that what spurred it was getting interested in techno through this book, Alvin Toffler's The Third Wave, which is what Juan Atkins read when he was kind of coming up with techno and came up with the name of it or whatever. Um, I actually found that book for like 25 cents, like a quarter or some shit, like um, at, a, at my local library in Florence, Alabama. Um, and yeah, learned all about this like new information age of like manufacturing and like living within like planned environments and such. And one of the things he kind of talks about in that book is the music factory and how music over time will be this like commodity that's reduced into small, really quick exchangeable bits. And when you kind of, this book was written in 1980, but by like say 1984, the music industry, which had switched from vinyl to CD kind of format, like vinyls were still happening, but CDs were really, I guess, cheap. And also you can just kind of, you know, produce much faster with them. Um, there was like a huge inflation in stock that happened in the nineties, along with the dot-com boom. And by like 97, both the internet bubble and this like CD inflated music industry bubble popped at the same time. So when you like kind of ask like, have we been here before? We absolutely have because that pop actually is what kind of dismantled the electronic music industry over in Europe, which kind of left the game wide open um, for websites like Discogs, Resident Advisor, Beatport and such to a pop up uh, in the year 2001 for both Discogs and Resident Advisor in 2004 for Beatport, which 
to kind of explain what those sites do, Discogs is what I consider to be like a stock market for physical record um, record sales. Um, and they actually do a trend report like every year or so stating how many physical copies of records they sell each year, regardless of like what that percentage is within like the global average of music revenue, um, which has been declining since 97. But as of last year, they claim that it's going up. Um, then you have Resident Advisor, which is a site that founded itself hoping to fill in a gap bet- at a time when a bunch of dance music magazines had already closed, like Music, Jock Slucky, uh, was it uh, Jock Slut or some Jockey Slut? It, uh, they have these weird names. Um, and yeah, it, it was Resident Advisor basically over time by about 2008 or so became this kind of weird multi-platform thing where you could like use it to find concerts like to find like like they had a chart for like the best djs ever or whatever but you could also kind of like use the site to get gear reviews you can use the site to get uh, album reviews that would kind of score all these releases and then across the strata of um possible of like uploading shows on the platform you could kind of Resident Advisor kind of became this weird gatekeeper model for basically what songs would get played in what clubs, which clubs would be, if they would determine which clubs were kind of the best clubs, which festivals were the best clubs, all through this like one size fits all kind of like a uh, platform. And then Beatport comes in in 2004 with a large investment from Richie Hodden, um, mm. which <laughs> basically becomes this like MP3, like ammo factory for, for American DJs. Um, and yeah, I I can go on about like these various constructions forever, but what we're kind of seeing over the last, what I would say last five years is along with like the rise of like streaming services as like the dominant way in which people listen to music, which is also like the least ethical of all of the ways to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, we've kind of seen a bunch of conglomerates of, people get together and go, okay, how can we cage in this abstract thing called music and release it in such a way that it, I mean, I guess a simple like Karl Marxian terms, right? It's like control the means of production and like distribution of wealth and you, yeah. Yeah, totally. Alex, did you want to ask a question? Sure, yeah, I had a question. And this is probably something I'm gonna ask of you and Michael in, in various iterations. But um, so some can would argue and say that given today's climate, you can make, anybody can make music via computer or phone or things like that. Um, and this is not to push back on your your thing. But yeah, it's just- push back. Like, <laughs> I thought it was, it was pretty valid, so. Uh, but just to you know, play devil's advocate, how does that fit into your pessimistic or more critical account of the impact that streaming has had on the industry or culture as a whole? And does that factor any way into your analysis of these things? I mean, I should say I, I was a really optimistic music listener when I started listening to music in like, like seriously in like 2005 or so. Um, and I got into music because I actually jumped I've been playing trumpet like my whole life since I was a kid, but I jumped out of the video game kind of tech, I don't know, yeah, video game industry into music because I saw something similar to what's happening now happening in video games where, I don't know if you remember when like the Nintendo Wii came out, there was this moment where I saw, and I hate to sound, like sound elitist like this, but you know, I saw like people using these like <laughs> weird like controllers and just like, you know, games had gotten pushed to a point where like, Final Fantasy was pushing the graphics like as far as they could and like Final Fantasy X had like blown up like a PlayStation 2 trying to like, you know, get all of this information into the disc. And then suddenly you see like all of gaming being reduced down to these like, to like Wii Sports and like, you know, cell phone like kind of scroll games, like these like like Candy Crush and stuff. Um, And something similar happened to television and film as well with the writer strike of 2008 that happened after the financial crash that kind of spurred to a lot of uh, smaller uh, $5 DVD dip in kind of films, like, like, okay, I'm not going to grab Dancer of the Dark right now, but I have this like $5 DVD and <laughs> DVD of like Dancer at that Dancer in the Dark that, um, yeah, that would get uploaded to platforms like Netflix, like really cheaply. Um, 
and they would say, you know, here, pay $5 and you get all of movies. Um, and the thing is, I was actually quite optimistic that in this time of free open distribution coming from a place in Alabama where I had to order everything on Amazon, like there was no place to go to buy like the best music, if you will, maybe Barnes and Noble, but um, yeah, I was really optimistic, but what I kind of saw actually was admittedly a bunch of consumers decide to use streaming and not buy physical music anymore. And if you remember like Yeezus is like, or Kanye's Yeezus was actually kind of an open casket funeral for physical music formats. Like that's why it has no cover. Um, and I thought that was a really poignant and quite early call on the way in which people's listening habits were changing with these platforms dominating and making listening to music more convenient. And then, I mean, you have like Life of Pablo that comes after that where he's like constantly remixing the album and switching where the tracks are for like months and you have Pitchfork like chasing him down every time he edited the album being like, oh my God, he changed that damn album again. But it's like- I love I mean, that. Yeah. That's yeah, no, I love that. I thought that was a really good use of the internet. Um, and maybe we'll talk about this more when Michael gets on. But there's this, it's like people will use the technology of the internet, but like they don't necessarily seem like they understand that it's like a thing that has, um, like it's flexibility, right? So like, I feel like he used it in a way that was like, here's the album, but like, why can't I edit it after it's out? Like there's this, mm -hmm. whatever. But, um, because of yeah, copyrights, that's, that's why. <laughs> Right, right. So it brings yeah. us back. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. I mean, it's the thing where I was optimistic because I assumed when you see people, you know, I always bring up Holly Hernan because she, around 2010, she was the one giving all the like lectures and TED talks around the laptop and being like, you know, here's a laptop. Like, this is the new instrument. And like, resident <laughs> advisor would write an article being like, we, vinyl only analog synthesizers only like you know laptops can't be instruments but but you have like mark fell in the corner like going doo -doo -doo, like with a laptop and they like love it but um yeah i mean i was quite interested to see where music would go in the 21st century finally after a decade of like carbon copy pop music and like you know various like offshoot independent music genres that were being you know, kind of shoveled down our throats by like some dudes in Chicago running Pitchfork. And honestly, like once Pitchfork was bought by Condé Nast and moved their offices into World Trade Center, I was kind of starting to worry that everyone was selling out <laughs> in a way. Um, kind of ruined a few things, so. Yeah. I mean, it's the monopoly, right? They just start, I mean, it's crazy because in like, what was it, 2007 or so, GQ had an article about the new stars of like independent music and it, they had like Grizzly Bear, Solange, Dirty Projectors, Vampire Weekend, uh, maybe the National, like all in suits and stuff, kind of taking pictures together. Um, and then Condé Nast like buys Pitchfork and starts shifting like employees between like the New Yorker, Pitchfork, W Magazine, GQ and like all of their various properties. Like I literally just saw them kind of like moving employees around and the opinions and the sort of discovery models that have been set up by these like independent platforms over the last 10 years suddenly got like scrambled. And it's funny, I hear a lot of people, you know, like I'll talk to friends from back home and they'll say, you know, I haven't listened to music in a long time or like seriously listened to music in a long time. And I can usually point it to being around the time when Pitchfork got bought by Condé Nast. Um, that people kind of stopped. I don't know what that correlation is, but. What year would you say that is around? I think that was 2015. Mm. I can Google that one. Pitch for okay. Yeah, because the blog, the blog era is like, what? It's like 2000, it's like blog 2002 to 2012. And then yeah. MySpace dies and then you get the rock, like, and two, I don't know, your Spotify became big, but then you, around 2010, the 2010s is when all of these platforms become everywhere, like Facebook and everything, right? And the platform model is kind of introduced, right? I mean, initially, like, these blogs are a really good idea if you think about it, in the sense that, like, being able to download MP3s and then hold it in the hub of, like, an MP3 player or, like, a, a modem, kind of, like, an iPod, is maybe the perfect way to carry like entire 
record collection like around with you if you like think about the the liberatory like process of like having a walkman or something um it really actually the ipod and deep like uh, mp3 model is a really good thing but once you it's kind of unfortunate because i mean once you like free up music into something like streaming where you can buy it wholesale that just you know just flattens it um right yeah, yeah. I there's think, definitely some kind of flattening, some kind of flattening effect with the introduction of the platforms. So we kind of talked about this, I think, when we did did our pre show um, a little bit, but I want to bring it up again. That there's like when we talk about the blogging era and stuff like that. I was talking about like, um, were you all talking about like before maybe using like Last FM and other sites, and then and then look using these uh, blogs like Gorilla vs Bear, Book and Vegan, mm -hmm. all the ones that were all around at the time. And I would say that that environment, and maybe this is just subjective, but it seemed like it was way more conducive to learning and finding out about new music, um, about the, you know, when, when CDs were super big, but they're still on the cusp of this, like, oh, what do we call it? Like, buy or, buy or steal it uh, yeah. economy. <laughs> yeah. You didn't download it, you bought it. Because um, I found that, like, uh, I had to get into music journalism in order to like like music because it was like I have to pay, I had to buy the mm -hmm. CD, so I better know something about it and know I'm gonna like it. And the downloading speed was so slow that you still kind of had to know what you were download downloading before you did it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that can really be. We can necessarily go back to that because I feel like that's just a part of that was just an after effect of the speed at the time of the internet being slow. But um, it does seem like, sure, like with the streaming stuff, more than anything else, although I definitely want to ask you in a sec, like also how much do you think everybody gets paid per platform and all these other things, because uh, <laughs> you smile. Uh, if, if it seems like there isn't this uh, amount of forgetting that's happening because of the platforms. So I find that like a lot of music is not really on there anymore, like more in the cut stuff or whatever. And also Netflix, and we'll just like band together all media platforms. Uh, that with this, like they're kind of selecting what you are going to listen to or what you're going to whatever, because they get the rights for whatever, which is usually from these monopolies that you're talking about. Uh, but that in the wayside, there's a lot of stuff that's that's super lost, and maybe that that is something you can spring off of. There was yeah. more. Of a no, no, no. That was totally it. I mean. The sad thing is that there used to be about three or four people at a record label that would do all the stuff that a streaming service does, which is make sure that like you get like a whole press like write up that gives context to this artist. There's a whole like, you know, another PR person that sets up like the dates onto which like the singles are dropping. So you usually get like three singles before the album comes out, but now you just get maybe one. Um, and it's, and it's funny when you say flattening, that's a, I mean, I think the term that's being used now to like describe any media on a platform is just creative content. And I mean, now that you actually, I was on Rolling Stone maybe about a month ago and there was an article on how to make music specifically for TikTok, like, like 30 second, like loops for TikTok, which I, I don't have a problem with that, but at the, I mean, actually, let me pair that with also the fact that Facebook uh, just recently bought a company that w allows you to make trap beats that you can just kind of like jump on. You can just kind of make it from your phone and like use it for your TikTok or whatever else. Um, and as a trained musician who's like played my entire life within like, you know, a sort of pedagogy, it's kind of disturbing to me like that anybody can make like a music beat. And, and I've, I mean, I think with that, there has been a gross, like, kind of, um, again, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to sound like elitist about this, but it, it is kind of a thing where you're like, okay, well, it, playing music is a skill, or at least a cultural kind of construction that takes a bit of time and uh, more than, like, one person being in a room to kind of, con to construct. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's actually. I, don't, I would push back on that a little bit. I'm sorry. I don't. 
I think I think it's cool. I think that it's cool that everybody can make music. I mean, you know, you're going to get a lot of boo-boo, but... Well, I'll put it this way. It's not even about the music being good or bad. It's the thing that I'm always... I'm always getting mad at DJs because the whole thing is like, look, every time a DJ plays a track, they need to, like, literally pay money to the person whose track they're playing. Like, that's how that should work copyright-wise. I don't I don't believe in, like, creative economies at all. Like, music I mean, should just you know, be... Yeah. Wait, you're muted. That was just like the woodwork. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't believe in like creative economies at all, but if we're gonna be stuck inside of this like, you know, political economy where we're all we all gotta get paid. Cause you know, you asked like what a streaming service pays, Spotify pays like point zero zero four cents on the dollar. I think Apple Music pays a penny and they bragged about it the other day for every stream. Tidal pays, I think, about 0.40 cents. And like, I don't know, and I'm like selling my records for like $21. So, you know, it's the that's a huge difference. One that is is best, or it's just like, you know, when you look at your analytics and you look at yourself and you look at what happens, oh, is it, yeah. or it's just not even through the streaming, it's just through selling your physical copies? Oh, no, I look at all the analytics. Like, I actually, like, lurk on my, like, Spotify analytics all the time. Actually, I just checked today and had, like, I think, actually, let me see. I'm going to tell you right now how many people listen to my new album, Soul Making The Odyssey, um, <laughs> <laughs> on Spotify. There was 4.5 thousand album streams, yeah, for this last month. And it's That's 0. 0. 0.00, thanks. 0. Point, yeah, point zero zero four cents for every single one of those streams. Um, so I don't know, I'll figure that out when the money comes. I don't know if you want to do something. How many cents? Point zero one. You made like- zero zero four. Oh, excuse me. You made like $2. Yeah. It's gonna be like you made like $2 or something like that, even though it streamed so much. Something really low. It's crazy. Yeah, and you yeah. think about like labels used to drop like at least at least they drop a Cadillac on you. They would they may own your music, but they would at least throw a Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. That also bail you out or whatever. I guess if you get in trouble, so there's yeah, but not anymore. <laughs> just, oh no, go. I'm sorry, Matthew. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, so you know the the current understanding of the platforms is obviously that they really exploit musicians and also um some people are using tactics like artists not artists are not going to stream their music on the platform um what would you say to those artists since um you know the platform logic is kind of that of well we don't need you right um because we we own you know we own attention right is kind of the idea right what would you say like what and what would you say is an effective means of, you know, getting out of this if there is one. And we'll get into this with Michael again, but. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, Dave, Daniel Eck, like Sean Parker, the guy from Napster, who's actually on the board of Spotify, you know, they're, uh, they're really good mobsters. They, I always joke that Sean Parker robbed the music industry twice and they still can't get him. It's it's hilarious, <laughs> like twice in two first decades. With, and it's, first with Napster, then with Spotify. Yeah, because he joined in like two thousand eight. Uh, joined Spotify, so it was just like a, just like Lily Pad, and he like helped launch Facebook right in between. Which I always joke that Facebook launched the same year that Arcade Fire got a ten out of ten from Pitchfork, which like set them up for that Grammy, and <laughs> um, and it's just. You so, yeah, love I mean, Fire. Yeah, I do love the Grammys because I wanted to like. I went to college with a bunch of Grammy voters, like as staff. Um, so in Florence, there was the uh, Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. I don't know if you've seen that like documentary, but like Taylor Swift and GQ and shit would come to town all the time to like take pictures of the studio. Um, and yeah, there would be like all these like folk singers, like the Alabama Shakes and like Jason Isbell and the 400 Club. Like they all like blew up while I was in college, which is why I thought I could move to New York and like navigate the music industry. Cause I like, did it did a small scale version of it in Alabama. Um, but yeah, the most ethical way to do this, honestly, just spend the money on a record, like actually go buy. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a record. It can be MP3s. It can just go to Bandcamp and buy it directly from the artist or label. Um, 
Because, I mean, for one, I just bought this techno record today, and it comes with like all this stuff. Oh, all right, I'm gonna. You're gonna see this. <laughs> see, I don't remember how much it was, but like you get like a whole like, uh, like look at all this. You get all this writing. You get <laughs> pictures and stuff. I and agree. Like, That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, to this day, to this day, either I either buy it or steal it. Sorry, like, but that's how. <laughs> oh no, I, I soul seek all the time. Take that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just go to the concerts. I can't buy as many. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's, that's the only way artists make money is by having live shows. Yeah, that's the thing. In, yeah, in Alabama, for whatever reason, I guess because like you had Atlanta on one side and Nashville like on the other. A lot of artists like Saint Vincent and Animal Collective and Fleet Foxes and stuff would come through on their tours, and that's when I realized that maybe those bands weren't as big as I thought they were. Um, <laughs> but it was like really cool. There'd be like thirty people in a room, and like Saint Vincent would be doing that like thing she does with the guitar, and um, and I got to like meet. <laughs> I have like signed. <laughs> like tune yards and like fleet boxes vinyls because it's me and like 15 other people in alabama who like gives a shit about this pitchfork music and that's it meant a lot both to me i think and hopefully the artists at that point to be able to just give them the 20 dollars for the vinyl and then get them to like sign it versus you know four thousand streams from some anonymous person in hung hungary or something i don't know yeah, I mean, I want to talk about geography later, too, with Michael, like about how, you know, platforms and even indie music and these things like kind of they hit differently in different geographies. And, you know, often when we when we, you know, kind of like talk about these analysis of uh, platforms that they don't necessarily apply evenly across the board, um, like the smooth smoothing of culture effect only works in like hyper urban areas, it seems. Um, I was going to ask you about one more thing. So the idea of platform capitalism is this idea that basically that you have to invest tons of capital up front. Uh, Uber and these bigger companies have to invest all of this capital to through venture capitalists to basically buy uh, market control or like monopoly. And you talk a lot about monopoly. Um, can you give us can you give us an overview on how the monopoly shifted that? you know, the shift from DIY blog era to this era, like going back again to the, the shock of the Toffler shock. Um, so we get, so just, you know, so viewers kind of understand how platform capitalism applies to music. And obviously, you know, you mentioned Grammys earlier, like, like you were saying last night, you were, you were saying, you you're not yeah. like you're not even a real musician now and you didn't say that in like a like a yeah. funny or like in a serious way it's more of a funny way like you have like you're only a musician once you get a grammy now because of platform uh music because basically you have to be like the biggest artist or like you don't get noticed because of these platforms totally i mean that's why that's one of the main reasons i've been writing this book on techno assembling a black counterculture is because um i should like have it but um, it's because techno, I or sadly, is like a perfect example of this this situation that you're kind of pointing at, and I think it's really sad and kind of cool that Juan Atkins read Toffler in 1980 and then invented this music that would sell initially like 50,000 copies like out of his car, like independently, um, but would immediately fall flat in the states and then blow up overseas somewhat anonymously and spur this entire industry. And it's funny, you talk about like platform capitalism hitting differently in different places geographically. Europe and Germany and Holland, or I guess I'll, I should say the Netherlands, they all kind of got dance music and all did this thing where they were like, we didn't know what these people sounded like. We just knew it was funky. And we just started like, they immediately got like their own instruments and started replicating these sounds. And then record labels, kind of like factory records and who owned the club, like Hacienda had their like rock band suddenly mimicking like techno to create these like dance beats. And before you know it, there was like a whole multi multi-million dollar like industry that had emerged overseas out of the sort of indie rock kind of, I don't know, like industry that they had over there. Um, whereas in the States suddenly again, after techno kind of leaves in 1988 in the 90s cds kind of inflate suddenly and there's a giant pop that happens where 
once people stop buying CDs, you have all of these properties like old Coltrane records, like old, like, you know, um, Stevie Wonder records, which you can hear in the grocery store. Like that's, that's what music is for is to be played in the grocery store or actually the Amazon bookstore is the perfect example of this, where you can go in there and hear some of the best music you've ever heard for free because, you know, they can just poke at universal music group and like, you know, literally spit out the, the copyright at like music, um, music. And that's kind of where we are now where there's, a wealth of intellectual properties and techno dance music itself is kind of lucky that because of the 20th anniversary of the love parade and second summer of love, these musicians, these like people like Moritz von Oswald, who was like considered, I would say obscure in the nineties suddenly is able to be like one of these intellectual properties that can get played out in like by accident at like a brunch spot because it has like, cause dub techno has like a nice, like, long loquacious beat or something i don't know <laughs> but um <laughs> but yeah it's after 30 years of inflation along with the you know u.s economy inflating in general um we're kind of at this point of i believe the term is like oligopoly is that we're in where there's multiple company multiple monopolies that are holding different means of production and different properties at wholesale value right. totally I'm, yeah. I mean, we saw this with Disney and Marvel and Star Wars and... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's similar to like a monarchy because basically the royalty, like the, the percentage of uh, the royalty was, I think, I think it was like five to seven percent of the total population, which is like, basically, you know, you have like the hyper elite and you have like the richest people in the world, but then you have that subclass that is really, you know, that secondary aspect of the monarchy. Um, uh, um, we should shift to Michael very soon, but um, and and then we can come back to this. Um, uh, DeForest, did you want to make any de closing marks about the oligar oligopoly? <laughs> so, I can't. Talk no, right I know now. exactly. That's what the ruling class wants. They're like, you, <laughs> they're like if you can't say the name, you can't get us. I mean, just, <laughs> no oligopoly today. I mean, that's a manual comp for you. But um <laughs> Oh my god, yes. Oh, oh. But no, it's um the only thing I can say is honestly just like look, we're 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 still in a pandemic, people are still dying, we're still in our homes. Everybody just buy music, buy a record player, buy a vinyl, and put put the record on the player, like get some wine, light some candles, get some weed, weed's legal in New York now. And like sit and read the little booklets in the vinyl. <laughs> like yes. do it, do it now. <laughs> yes. Buy the vinyl, Please. that's what we're at. Buy your yeah. Okay. But buy a living artist's vinyl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like Definitely. buy someone who needs the money. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see you soon. Hey Michael, how's it going? Oh, you're we're muted. Very... Yeah, okay, there we go. Hey, uh, it's going okay, how are you? <laughs> Well, I know how you're um, doing. I've been watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're really happy to have you on the show. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, uh, here's Michael's book, um, Creative Control. It's called The Ambivalence of Work and the Cultural Industries, and it's out on Columbia Press. Um, it's a very beautiful book. Very lucky that they sent us a copy. Um, so welcome, Michael. Um, I know that you've been sitting backstage for a while, and um, you know, listening to our conversation. And I really want to bring you and DeForce together again. But um, give us a really quick introduction on why you wrote this book and why it's important today in this contemporary era. Sure. Um, so, okay. So like the book, um, it's uh, it's it kind of comes out of what they call like the labor process tradition in sociology, basically like Marx's tradition in ethnographic kind of labor scholarship. And um, in that tradition, it kind of focuses on, you know, a key question of like, how is it that capitalist organizations uh, organize and control work? How is it that they, you know, organize and control labor? Um, and so like rather than like a zoomed out view that might be offered by like traditional like political economy or something like that, basically we kind of look at like how control over labor is exerted like during the working day, right? Uh, which is to say it's ethnographic, often participant observation, 
uh, which is what I do, right? I go and kind of embed myself in workplaces, um, either by getting a job or finding some way in to kind of just like hang out with people and see what their working day is like. And I think in the book, uh, what I'm trying to do there is to use two case studies of workers in what I call the culture industries. Um, so uh, a music studio and uh, workers at a YouTube management organization. And I use this to develop um, kind of a theory of creative labor, a sort of like a roadmap uh, for understanding creative labor, much in the same way that like someone like Arlie Hochschild, um, like about 40 years ago, tried to do something similar for um, what she called emotional labor, right? And so I'm trying to think about like, what kind of labor is, is required of people in these jobs and um, that we usually think of as like requiring creativity? Like, what does that mean in practical terms? And um, how is it that these organizations control or at least capture that creativity or creative labor. And, um, you know, I think it's like interesting now. So, and I'm interested in that in two contexts, a more conventional kind of context, uh, which is the sort of music recording studio in the book. And then the other one is like YouTube content production, which really gets at this issue of platform capitalism that you were talking about. And, and I think the broader, kind of theoretical thing that I'm also kind of interested in beyond just like the kind of puzzling question of like, well, how is it that like an organization controls creativity, right? Which I think is kind of on the surface, at least kind of puzzling. Um, right, right. Is, is yeah. also this thing that I think DeForest was kind of getting at, which is like, what do we do in the context of like a capitalist economy that kind of demands creativity, right, or demands expression um, and is really organized to capture our um, expressive capabilities, our sort of creative abilities in different ways. Um, and for me, like, like that really throws into question a lot of like sociological theories and critical theories of um, of like labor, but also just like culture in in capitalist societies, right? So like, um, going back to, you know, like the labor process kind of tradition that I come out of, like we, like most of the 20th century people were thinking about 20th and early 21st century, thinking about ways in which, you know, capitalist labor processes like remove creativity, right? And so you get books like, uh, Harry Braverman's Labor and, Monop and Monopoly Capital, which is all about what they call de-skilling, right? Where you make the job simple so that workers are easily replaceable and they don't have to think too much. Um, and those are out of the Fordist and the Taylorist. Like Fordism right? and Taylorism, right? And like a lot of theories of, of work in sociology, I think are still anchored to that model or like a service work model. If you think about like people at like call centers where they have to follow a, a, a rigid script of say this and say this and say this, right? And, um, and, or service interactions, like you go to McDonald's and they always have to say certain things and they're monitored and, and they have, to, right? And um, that's the way that a lot of work was talked about, even going all the way back to like say Marx or something like that, right? And a lot of jobs nowadays, not just in cultural production, not just musicians, but a lot of different kinds of jobs require, you know, people to kind of come up with their own way of doing things or improvise on the fly or constantly learn new skills and all of these different things. And so like for me, that really, like, what do you, how do you explain that, right? Because like these older theories of like how capitalism controls labor doesn't really help you out that much in understanding what's going on in the last like 20, 30 years. And when you throw in platforms on top of that, then it even further complicates that, right? And so there's that. And then if you think about other kind of, we talked about this a little bit like yesterday when we were talking like like kind of critical theories of like cultural production. Um, right, they're, like enlightenment as mass deception. Like, that so, kind of seems like, like a it, through. Going back to yeah, people like Adorno, but also I'm thinking in like, the 1970s you have what is sometimes called like the Birmingham school. So like people like Stuart Hall or Dick Heptage, I think all of those in different ways, they kind of say like, okay, well you have the mass culture system 
Mm-hmm. Mass culture kind of removes creativity. It smooths things out. It makes it more palatable or more commodifiable. And and you get that from like Adorno, right? And he has these kind of very negative view of things in yeah, the culture industry, enlightenment as mass deception from the 40s. But in the 70s, you, you get people saying, people like Stuart Hall or Dick Hebdige or Paul Willis saying things like, um, well, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe you have that. Maybe you have these kind of like hegemonic kind of corporate media, but then you also have the creative acts of resistance in the interpretation of those texts, right? And so you get these people talking about like punk rock or early hip hop, or people are taking mass cultural phenomena and like tweaking it and twisting it and doing different things to it, right? And that's framed as kind of resistance in the way that I think labor scholars might have said like, well, an act of resistance is a worker coming up with a creative way to like, um, to like lay about at work without getting yelled at by the boss, right? Or like, or like, you know, having a wild cat strike or something like that. That's how labor scholars might have thought it was like creative acts at work. And uh, if you think about it, the creativity in those contexts is thought of as like resistant to the capitalist order. And I think now we're constantly told that we should not only be creative, we should, you know, express ourselves and we should do it at work. We should do it not just at work, but we should do it on a platform, right? Things like YouTube, things like right. TikTok, right? Express yourself, like, and do it in this very specific kind of way that is desired by the platform. So I think like to go back to your question, like, um, yeah, I think the, the book is really just trying to get at this question of like, how is it that like capitalism kind of invites and also kind of tries to control human creative creativity? What does it mean by that? How is that maybe a kind of classed creativity that it's inviting and also right. a gendered and probably and I would say probably erased creativity as well. Uh, or mm-hmm. racialized creativity, and um, and then beyond that, like how is it that platforms are changing that, right? Sure. Right, totally, totally. Uh, to to piggyback off of that, something that we did we did discuss before that I want to bring up again, I think it's important is um, your idea of of alienated judgment, because it specifically talks about how, the ways in which one can be uh, separated from their own drive or their own pursuit of purpose within these economies. And and you note it and you say that it is connected to Marx's theory of alienation, which is from uh, the economic and philosophic manuscripts, just as an overview. Um, In it, Marx says that through the labor process, people are alienated from their, from themselves and other things in four different ways. Uh, I believe it's from each other, from uh, what you call it, the uh, from themselves, right? Uh, They're estranged from themselves, from others, from their product and uh, from culture and and from other work. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. The the product, the act of production, from themselves or their species essence and from other workers, right, this point. Yeah. So, uh, and how does that all work in and tie together for everybody to kind of understand? Yeah, um, okay, so I think one of the kind of provocations of the book is that, you know, part of how these people are, how, part of how creativity is controlled is that people are kind of invited uh, by management to kind of do these things, like express themselves, take control, um, uh, of their job and people find these really that invitation to be kind of a- a- affectively um, in- engaging or, or or they find the actual experience of doing the job kind of like aesthetically enrolling is the term I use. And just basically it's like at a visceral level kind of like it, it's engaging, it's exciting. Even people talk about like looking at their data analytics as kind of you know, uh, like like a like a roller coaster ride or something like that, or it's it's electric and it's like a video game and stuff like that. And so there's that. And you know, for me, I kind of make this argument that like, well, these kind of creative jobs or like capitalism in a way kind of dominates by enchanting by by providing these kind of enchanting experiences. 
uh, which I think sounds like some sort of kind of like nightmare, <laughs> right? Situation, right? Uh, in which people's like subjectivity is like thoroughly dominated. And um, if we, if I ended there, I think it would paint that kind of picture. But what I actually find is like, okay, people have this really immersive kind of like uh, viscerally engaging experiences of their tasks. And they, they'll, they'll say things like, I really love my job. I love being creative. And when they say that they mean, they are usually referring to these kind of immersive moments where they're kind of like lost in the, the flow of their job. But upon reflection, right, they say like, oh, well, the things I make in those moments are, are garbage, are crap are vile, are slop for the trough, and all these different things, right? And, I love that metaphor, by the way. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. In a book. And keep in mind, like, the people that I do research on are often quite, I mean, you know, like, even if they're quite precarious, or even if their jobs don't pay that much, um, they're still, I, I would say, if we think globally among the kind of elite workers, right? They're like people in culture industries in the United States, right? So they're like, if we think about the global context, and they're quite educated and so they have all kinds of like clever ways of describing themselves probably more clever than i could ever be uh or hope to be but um so like yeah like slopping the trough or um and these other kind of turns of phrase that some of the the people that i hung out with have um but so getting to my point basically they're kind of like affectively aesthetically kind of enrolled or engaged but their judgment their decision making which is required for the job is actually is put to someone else's ends or something i kind of say in the book is like their their means of creative labor is put towards someone else's ends and right. uh which is to say it's kind of alienated in the same way that like say uh uh you know, someone, you know, shoveling coal in the, you know, pits and sort of Marx's writings or something like that is kind of alienated from their body um, while they're doing that, you know, and they're toiling in the service of someone else. Uh, these people are kind of alienated from their capacity for judgment, which isn't to say that it's denied. They actually are required to make, to use their aesthetic judgment, to use their analytic judgment um, on the job to make decisions about various things yeah, it's but they're doing them. it for someone else right and so like for for you know people working in a recording studio it's usually subordinate to whoever their client is usually a musician maybe a record label or something like that but in the context of youtube content production it's it's usually subordinate to the algorithm or what it, or or more importantly whatever they're told the algorithm supposedly wants um, right. Because in some ways, like the algorithm, what it values or doesn't value is kind of like fundamentally unknowable in a way. Because, I mean, you really don't know how it works. You only know what you're you're told, right? And um, oftentimes... It's a black least, box. It's a black box. Black, right, exactly. black box governance, as you yeah. refer to it. Yeah, so it's... it's um, so not only... So with platform capitalism, like I guess my take would be that not only... Is, is it that people's judgment is like alienated or subordinate to a client or some other third party, but it's, it's subordinate to this black box. Um, and so the only ways that what people do is like, they try to figure out what the black box wants. And, um, you know, sometimes like people sometimes get excited about that and it's like a puzzling kind of problem to be solved. They get to, be creative in doing so, right. um, but but I would say an equal amount of time, like people voice these things where they're like, well, I think that this would make for a really good, you know, vlog post, but the algorithm and my manager at my management company think that these other things where I basically make fart jokes or, you know, get drunk <laughs> on, yeah. get drunk on camera or do kind of more like lowest common denominator kind of humor um, are are better because they they drive views and really that's all that's important. So, um, so basically they're alienated from their creative judgment because yeah. Uh, yeah. they have to make this trough content. Like this content is like the lowest bar possible is what you're saying, right? Yeah, 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 that, yeah. Do you think that introduces like this level? So like the people who are, um, you know, the people that are 
often those who are supposedly supposed to be automated out last is the management class. This is a type of automated management, isn't it? This is like a this is like the introduction of like the cyborg management crew where be, basically because the black box is you know introducing this new type of management um the judgment that you usually would be in their place which um in your book you're saying that the creators have been alienated from their judgment right the only people that have subjective judgment and decision making power are basically these people in the elite industry jobs who are usually like very they're like white upper class people that happen to be in this position and they have some kind of subjectivity, but they're just, their subjectivity is tied up in capitalism, which heterog you refer to that as like heterogeneous or something like that. But so like where, so if, if actually these people, like where in the system, in the circuit, is there actually any level of creativity if even the subjectivity of the top class has been even alienated to, I mean, obviously, you know, board members and stocks and these types of things like what what level of subjectivity exists in the system i think that's a good question i mean i, I think for me like it's not a matter of saying like these people are creative or these people aren't right it's a matter of saying like how how is that creativity kind of formatted or how is it structured and what are the structures that kind of enable very particular kinds of creativity and so like there's I think some of the stuff that and I think DeForest was kind of getting at this, right? Like there's like this way of making say music or, or film or other kinds of cultural products or whatever we want to call them, um, art and things like that, that is oriented towards kind of like what, what pushes, I mean, I'm kind of, for those watching who are maybe familiar with more like sociology kind of stuff, there's like a production that's oriented towards the kind of autonomy of the particular field that you're working within, whether that's music or film or television and kind of pushing the limits of that field forward. Like, you know, what is right, the right, right. most like innovative thing we could do with a television show or like, or if we're making, you know, kind of trashy pop punk, like what is the most innovative way we could push that genre forward, whatever. And it has its own kind of internal logic as opposed to just like what is gonna sell the most units, what's gonna drive up the most numbers. And those are different. They both require a degree of, of creativity and they both require kind of work through and upon signs and symbols, which is a very loose way of just saying like human creativity, right? And um, but they're oriented towards different things and what is recognized as being like valid in either orientation um, is slightly different, right? And so like, I think like, like among um, platforms, platforms demand a very particular kind of expression. And I think you're right to, to say that like, um, well, let me back that up. They, it's not that like people aren't like, I think you still have to be quite inventive to come up with like a new kind of like goofy TikTok video. But the way that it's structured, you, it's like not, you don't want to be too different. And the way that people talk about it, at least the ones I interviewed. Um, That's a great qualifier, by the way, Michael. <laughs> that really helps is is that like the way that they talk about it is very different than when they talk to some of um like music people um or in a previous project i had talked to like dozens of like record label owners and talk about how talk with them about how they make decisions about like what to promote and what not to um but a lot of the people that i've interviewed on the music side of things will you'll get a range and you get a range of some people who are just like, I want to make something that's cool and exciting and innovative and really pushes the boundaries of things. And you'll get other people who say like, yeah, I think that's cool. But what I want to do is have something that still sells quite a lot. And, uh, uh, but you know, is maybe a little bit innovative, but is, and then you'll have other people who are like, I just want to make something that's massively popular. I don't you know, care about anything just as long as it, it sells a lot of units. And among the YouTubers that I dealt with, 
um, I didn't have that. I didn't find that range. I found everyone just saying like, I just need to get the numbers up. Um, even if I think it's kind of bad, I need to push the numbers up and, and, um, or I need to, um, basically that was the majority of what people were saying. The other half of it would people would say either that, or they would be trying to expand their brand, their personal brand. And so rather than right. having this kind of autonomous versus, uh, kind of like market oriented or, or what the fancy yeah. term is like heteronymous logic, heteronymous, it's, it's that's these what two is, yeah. kind of market logics, right. Where it's about self personal branding on one end and it's about like increasing the numbers on the other hand. And ideally they go together, but they don't necessarily go together. Um, well, I jump in for just one second. I feel like it's yeah. like it feels like there's like three there's three things really that we're like yeah. explaining that you're bringing up here. So there's one in that there's the um the person who wants to make the content and they're doing it with this in keeping this algorithm that they don't have any um, idea of in mind, which is predetermined for you by YouTube and whatever. Um, and then there's also I guess like uh the type of content that actually like makes it big on the internet because the algorithm isn't like necessarily informed by nothing like it is informed by like what people watch even when they change it they'll switch it around to maybe make it so that people actually get into different types of stuff but that might be part of why like people get the lowest common denominator of stuff because it's like the cyclical thing where also like keep clicking on the lowest common denominator stuff um does that make sense and then there's like well, no, we can have a discussion about it in a second. And then I yeah. guess I was like also bringing in at play like, um, well, cause I feel like with clickbait, with the clickbait economy, what it kind of showed was that people are pretty like roped in by like, uh, and this is throughout history, like salacious headlines, like things like that. Um, anger can get as many clicks as like whatever. So there's lots of people that will exploit that. Um, and then, what I'm thinking of is sort of this, what you're bringing up with brands and stuff kind of also shuttles in this like nefarious, um, nefarious capitalism in that while everybody's talking about growing their brands, usually that at least today like includes getting a sponsorship or whatever. And usually if you watch like YouTube, it's like the f same five companies. It's like for Shein Cream is one and like VPNs is another one and that's part of it. But people don't talk at all about that. Part, they'll just kind of like subtly market all these other things in there. So I don't know if you have something to, to say on that. I guess because like I had a question, um, maybe this is a segue into my question. Like given your field work was done like some years ago, which in internet time is decades, yeah. <laughs> how do you feel about the current influencer landscape, say like the, like the Pauls, Jake Paul, and then Team 10, these like giant houses of, of social media stars that get together? Yeah. Um, and, and as well as, as you bring up prank channels a lot, the scandals yeah. regarding the authenticity of these pranks. Yeah. Um, and then I have a follow up, I guess, but like that would be the first. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, and I think you're right. Like, I think, I think, um, uh, I think a, a matter of a few years is like decades in terms of like the uh, changing kind of landscape. But I think, I think my hope is to like, at least get a couple things where like a couple things out there where like conceptually there's some similarity, but I think the roots of a lot of what you're describing, um, whether it's uh, these houses, these collab houses, I believe they were calling them a couple years ago. Like, I think like that idea of like collaboration um, and, and getting these people who drive views, like that was going on, I think about five or six years ago, the actual having a house in which they all live, um, strikes me as just like a cost saving mechanism, right? Like it, it, rather than having to coordinate collaboration across distances, like this was something that like the company where I did field work was, would have to do and struggled with, like, how can we provide a way that we can get YouTubers to, um, or content producers to just, to, to collaborate with each other and kind of cross pollinate. Um, and so like putting them all together, like physically, co like located together, I think solves that problem in a way that like, you know, they were talking about like putting up like message boards and these different ways that like tools for people to 
organized collaboration. So like, I think the roots of some of those things were already kind of germinating a few years ago. And I think like the, the logic behind that is again, like scaling, right? That's like a term or like this, like exponential growth in views um, for the sake of, of views, right? Um, um, and, and I think a lot of the same thing, like this, like odd constructions of masculinity you get with these, like the, the Paul brothers and this sort of like, I don't know, like this very intense kind of provocative, um, often uh, at best, at best highly problematic kind of content. Um, I think you see like, I think in the book, actually, like I describe a lot about like pranksters and stuff like that, like a lot of that stuff drives views, like a lot of this and is supported by the behind the scenes kind of like management companies that help promote these people. And they like, they still suffer from a lot of the like organizational problems that the conventional kind of media industries do, right? In that they have um, at the top, um, so I mentioned this in the book, like the, the actual organization where I was doing field work and their creators and, and, and or YouTubers or content producers or whatever, um, all of those people are, it's quite diverse, but the leadership in a lot of these places are still like white men, the same as like other film industries, you know, traditionally or film or video or music even too, right? And so you still get, regardless of who makes the content, the people at the kind of upper level kind of corporate side of things um, are still making quite similar decisions to promote kind of like misogynist kind of content, to promote stuff that is at best highly problematic when it comes to race, if not outright racist, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, and, and things of that nature. Um, so like, do I think it's, it's just like, well, we live in a, society that wants this tr like bad like stuff that has I issues like you said i i think so but i also think like that the like the way that people get fed content and also these other kind of intermediary organizations um certainly aren't helping <laughs> that oh, you know sure. no, i agree and not to, to qualify i mean more like um I don't mean necessarily the problematic aspects. I feel like that's something that's sort of taught to people, but I mean like the more visceral, like looking at a fight or whatever on YouTube or looking up that type of stuff. I mean, you can make maybe connections between that and like Victorian era or like other eras where they were like these mass spectacles of people watching mm -hmm. other. Um, the Coliseum. And, you know, like that's right. I mean, we're in that way. Um, and I think that also does drive some stuff on the internet. And maybe that's just a function of being able to watch people all the time. Um, yeah. But not, yeah. no, definitely like the poll and, and a lot of them like sort of hijack things, particularly even these, particularly, the, particularly, sorry, these prank channels in that um, I think it was Joey Salads who had a bit of a scandal some years ago from uh well all of them are, are basically fake but his trump he had these pranks where it was like um someone who who was pro-trump or something getting harassed basically and he would do a bunch of those but they turned out to be all sort of staged and then yeah. oh really wow his, his um reaction behind it was or his uh explanation behind it was well it does happen because he he voted for trump and he thinks these things so it's, it's interesting also like this aspect of like fake reality that the yeah. creator can sort of play into because to him in his mind, well, this is something that does happen. So that's how I'm gonna justify giving people this fake content. Um, and with that yeah. said, I guess I wanted to ask if there was anything you would have changed or like you would add to your initial analysis throughout the book. Hmm, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think so there's kind of a lot going on and it's kind of dense, but I think like there's, there's two things that I'm kind of like working on expanding. And I think one kind of gets at this thing about the, the Trumper kind of YouTubers, but there's, 
a there's this, this interesting thing that I noticed from going to some of the conferences that they have around YouTube and, and video content in general in Southern California. There's what they call VidCon. And okay. yeah, and they have all of this, there's all this talk about the diversity of content creators, the diversity of social media stars. And you see a lot of that in the people that they have on stage and stuff like that. But then when you look at the lists of like who is really having the big numbers, right? It's still mostly, I mean, the biggest person for years was PewDiePie, who's like right. you know, a Scandinavian kind of gamer, video gamer. And um, which is to say like a white male. And if you look at the top people, it's still, there's two things that are noticeable about it is, is that one, they're still predominantly white. They're still predominantly English speaking also, um, oh, which is interesting because given the global quality, like even though PewDiePie was from Sweden, I think his, his contents in English. And that's one of the and, requirements of the influencer agencies too. Yeah. They, that, they have English to be English speakers. Content. Yeah. And um, so there's that. And, um, so what I'm what I'm getting at is there's an uh, so there's that but then there's also like who's curiously like left out of this like VidCon kind of narrative are also kind of like uh, sort of white rural YouTube so you have this weird thing where like there's this diversity narrative I wanted to get that's into not that. that's not quite true or not quite accurate right there's like more access to people of uh, 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 like people of color or people yeah. from different parts of the world but there's not necessarily um if you look at who's successful it still very much looks like like other conventional film industries and from talking to people they would talk about like brand deals and like you know talking to um uh people of various marginalized groups they would talk about the difficulty by which uh, uh, that they had in getting those brand deals so there's still this like inequality behind the scenes going on um, that falls along all your conventional lines of like race, gender, and and class, and so like, and then, then there's this also this issue of geography that isn't really do deeply gone into. So so basically, what I'm saying, like, projects that I'm kind of working on now is trying to get at this issue of of like racial and geographic inequality that is still kind of reproduced on platforms that just really isn't. Um, it's like touched upon in the book, but it's not like theorized in any kind of real way, you know? Um, not to, not, to, I think, not to, to, to push, no, I mean, it's like in addition to what you're saying, I think it's not really a push. But yeah, exactly. For sure, I do agree, like most of the people that are like, I call it like capital Y YouTube, like YouTubers are yeah. like a certain, it literally just replicates all the issues that we talk about in society if you're even like remotely left leaning um, and, and in terms of representation. Yeah. However, what also seems to happen on YouTube is that like, I would say that there is actually like a lot of representation, but it's like in YouTube sort of fosters like these like small pockets that are not really that small. Right. Like these, there's lots of like black YouTubers and stuff that have like, 100k plus views that we have never even heard of that i only found out through watching like drama channels and stuff like yeah. that there's also this big uh there's also a lot of like right-wing youtube and stuff right now yeah. actually it is almost it's like a lot of like black manosphere people becoming big but that's because when the alt-right was really big and i used to like watch all that stuff just to get you know acclimated mm -hmm. The, there was no press about them, so there was no reason to take them off the internet. And I think it also was tying into what I was trying to say earlier, which is like sometimes people just like to click, or they like things that are sort of like reactionary or whatever, and they fall into that trap, and then it's just its own spiral. And it's not until people like covered it that then YouTube changed the algorithm to get them kicked off. But now we see all these black manosphere people, and it's going to be a while before they like catch up and then they kick these people off. So yeah. I think like, in addition to what you're saying, there's also this like, I think, I think it like kind of just goes with what you're saying because throughout the book you're talking about this twofold process within the internet so you can like do a lot and almost anybody can have access but at the same time it is still very limiting yeah mm -hmm. yeah and actually there's like a really cool book that came out like last year um that kind of gets at that more 
pointedly, it's called Ballad of the Bullet. It's about like drill uh, musicians on YouTube. Oh, right. And it's by Forrest Stewart. Um, and it's it's cool, but like or, or like it's it's like actually kind of like a really heartbreaking book. But uh, but it's about um, how these people making like drill content, the way in which I'm kind of not going to do it the best service in this short summary, but the way in which that they're offered the very real opportunity for some economic gains. Um, these are like young men on the south side of Chicago, and um, is by playing into a lot of image like stereotypes of black yeah. urban life that also put their life at risk um so like making videos of them engaging in like you know gunfights and things like that or like like they're playing up this kind of like gangster kind of drug dealer image uh in way and like that's the way that they chase views and, and it gets at this issue of like opening up opportunities for people but in these very circumscribed ways that that aren't necessarily that seem to reproduce a lot of inequalities that that are already present in the world. If that if that makes sense, what I'm trying to get. So like basically, I'm saying like yeah. It's also like a real world example. Yeah. It's also a real world example of like a new definition of optimization. Yeah, is putting your life at risk. You know, yeah. and that's like a new form of like biopolitics, right? Is that the biopolitics of the algorithm? You know, that it forces. It doesn't force you, you have the choice, of course, but yeah. knowing that that presents some kind of leverage and this hierarchy that we live in, it becomes a danger. Yeah, yeah. well, also yeah. to bring everything in, because I feel like I've also I've written about drill or whatever, so it's like with Katie Gott Banzer and oh, like nice. those, okay. they were super, um, she in particular was super, she was really upset that, uh, and just to bring everything in, like that journalists and music journalists kept using like the, um, the Chirac comparison. So comparing like Chicago because right. at least one year it had more shootings than in, in Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. Um, and she was like, well, this is true, but like, are you going to reduce all of our music constantly to the fact that it's like people are dying and like all the shooting and stuff? I feel like it's something that um, a lot of Chicago artists in the drill scene have sort of talked about in that sense. It's like, yeah, I'm talking about my reality in my life, but I'm also like a writer and all these other things. So why reduce me down to just this? Um, and maybe to first jump in, because that kind of goes into like segues into yeah. journalism on black bodies and black music. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this actually reminded me of something I was reading earlier today in Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic, um, <laughs> where it was mentioned that oh, Jimi wow. Hendrix actually went over to England and kind of had to, yeah, play up the whole like gypsy, like sexy thing, I guess, like, and, and be this like stereotypically black person while also like, you know, wowing them with the guitar and, um, which I guess etched, etched him ahead of like Eric Clapton in sales or something like that. And it's, you know, I think about that kind of stuff a lot. Yeah, I know Eric Clapton, he's like quoted in there too. <laughs> I don't know, my grandfather well. loves that stuff. <laughs> Did you know that Jimi Hendrix was actually in the Isley Brothers for a while? Um, so there you go. Um, <laughs> okay, I started making really psychedelic music. But no, um, but no I, I totally kind of relate to that in a sense, because I mean, you've kind of gotten into this quite a bit, Alex, this idea of like, the drive or, or i guess like what's whatever is happening to humans when they desire to click something it typically things like trauma typically relates um mm -hmm. to people which i've always found really disturbing um but i mean most of my yeah. work is about the tragedy of blackness within side of the myopia myopia of music journalism and how music journalists have had the insight into the black situation by virtue of like even getting access to this music and what they typically get is some sort of carbon copy kind of uh press note regurgitation to the point that like i mean when i'm like talking to detroit techno people sometimes there is this like script that kind of comes into play where they're like you know i i found that it seems like a lot of them feel like they have to tell people that they like craft work because it's been like paired it at them for so long since like the suggestion was made in the first liner notes of like the first compilation of like techno in 1988 um 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it honestly has to do with the fact that music journalists are both lazy and uninformed. Um, I mean, when I worked at every magazine I've worked at, the music journalists have not been worth their salt. Like they basically just sit around, they drink beer all day, and they don't listen to music whatsoever. I've never seen a music journalist own a pair of headphones ever in my 10 years of work. So like, <laughs> just like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think, yeah, because it's like they've been covering sort of particularly black music and, and particularly hip hop terribly for many years. And I think it's just coming up to mm -hmm. like, catch up with everybody. Um, and that like, cause earlier we were talking about the blog era and maybe we can all jump in cause we were talking about um, last time like punk and these geographic spaces that can sort of connect everybody. Um, and the ways in which maybe like the internet and other technology can be used in these more like revolutionary ways. Um, while there's also like a big history of a lot of journalists and a lot of these platforms like neglecting to tell the history of black music directly, I guess, or like all this other, all this other forgetting that happens. Yeah, I think it was around the blog era when it was like, oh, you have acceptable rap. So we can listen to MF Doom, we can use listen to like other things, but we're not gonna listen to like actual Big Daddy Kane. And I felt like throughout it, there was this like inference that this is like not okay content to like put on and that's why we're not gonna talk about it, but also that they didn't really listen to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I mean, they probably play off of each other, <laughs> both of those, so. I mean, Footwork's a perfect example of this, actually. And I, I say that coming, like, being signed to the label that <laughs> discovered Footwork. Um, I mean, it was a cute idea where, like, you know, Mike Paradina is the guy who, like, got his record label, um, Planet Muse, started by Virgin Records um, in 1994, which was a few years after Virgin Records sub-label released the first techno compilation that basically dispersed techno to the whole world without it being this like, you know, codified as this like decidedly black urban thing. Um, yeah, he kind of does the same thing where he like pokes into Chicago and goes, whoa, there's this like cool music here and puts it together into a compilation called Bangs and Works that like blows this music up across like the blogosphere. But the moment DJ Rashad dies, the moment he died, everyone just, all the shits that they had to give about that music just went right out the window. And it was kind of a um, a funny thing because I, I mean, I literally watched the dance music industry for about seven years, dig through all of the different kind of like, Planet Mew is the label I'm on um, for now. <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a thing of like, <sighs> I mean, yeah, what do you do with this idea of, I mean, the, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to do with this sort of wholesale, um, how should I put it? It's kind of like a zoo, honestly, these like compilations, um, which, and I can actually kind of revert this back to the 90s, um, which refers a bit to what you were talking about earlier, Matthew, when you were asking about where Toffler kind of fits into the current like crisis that we're having now. Mixmag actually, Mixmag, the first electronic music magazine that like kind of exists, actually discovered and put into place all of the top selling DJs we know right now from Green Velvet to Seth Troxler to, um, I don't know, there's a bunch of them, but they were all kind of put into place in the mid nineties with these compilations that were called like Global Techno or something like that, where they would just kind of like, you know, close their eyes, the editor would close his eyes and just like pick a spot, like Ibiza or something, or pick like this random ass place and go, the, he would write a whole like set of liner notes for the CD where he's like, the scene there is great, it's a tropical environment and just kind of sell this luxury travel version of dance music with like a single DJ making a mix dedicated to that space. Mm. And it's a discovery zoo that that, that like CD is. Um, I yeah. wonder, like, yeah, that's totally, I mean, like, that weird kind of, like, plucking things from, and there's a long history of that, right? It's not just with, like, dance compilations, it's with, it goes all the way back to, like, um, you know, like, old, like, uh, what is it, like, like, Lomax recordings of, like, blues musicians, right? There's this kind of, like, mm. like, collecting kind of specimen kind of quality to that and and obviously that that i mean you could probably speak better than i about how that intersects with like 
histories of, of, of racism in the U S and things like that, or more globally. Right. But like, but if you think about like platforms, some of the stuff like with Spotify or even like a band camp or a SoundCloud, right. It like, it kind of could enable a similar kind of thing, but it also enables people from these disparate kind of places to have the kind of global access hypothetically without a label to put out those compilations. And yet it seems as if people A, aren't doing that. And that might have to do with some of the consumption patterns that you talk about and B, like, regardless of having that access, you're still kind of feeding into the platform economy or platform capitalism, right? right? Like, yeah. like, regardless of whether you're in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest or the South or the you know, Pacific Northwest or wherever, um, you're still kind of, you're always already producing for these global corporations, right? Like, uh, in a way that I think the more kind of regional, we were talking about this a little bit like last night, more right. regional kind of like indie or like punk scenes had this network of distribution that was not as certainly not as developed as like a Virgin Records or, or, or whatever, but did seem to kind of work in a way, maybe up until like 2005. Or oh, for sure. You know, um, which is kind of different. Yeah, that's why I like that DeForest just always brings up growing up in the South, um, something I relate to growing up in the Midwest. Um, but basically the idea of the platform economy is, and just like the internet in general is that there's no such thing as the local anymore, right? Because everyone, and that's the theory at least, everyone has access to the internet, right? And so the flattening effect that happens is that, you know, we have global travel, we have internet speeds, we can be anywhere we want, theoretically, right? Um, and so the, you know, in the blog era, you know, we were entering that with like MySpace and stuff, right? In the early blog era. Um, but we weren't, it wasn't really, it was still pretty local in my experience at least. And I was, you know, starting to tour a little bit even, still pretty regional at most um, and the, you know, the legacy and just like music industries still had a huge influence on everything. Um, but, you know, that's the idea is that, you know, we have access, right? But it, you know, Alex and, Alex and Paige and I were talking about this though. There's this other thing that just kind of gets ignored a lot of times. I think when people talk about the, you know, the be beauty and brilliance of like the new technologies and that's, you know, we've been in the slow, slow march of neoliberalism entering our lives at such subtle levels, you know? And so like, as technology gets better and better and better, supposedly, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has access to those technologies. And we can talk about geographies and how that relates to race and class and all of these different intersections, right? But neoliberalism and inequality ju have just increased right things have just gotten worse for most people so like if we're talking about like do these platforms per you know present a new level of access to creativity well maybe if like the conditions have been stabilized and if there was some kind of stabilization that had occurred 10 years ago or 20 years ago or something when you know wages weren't becoming stagnated and productivity wasn't you know you know, making it so that even skilled labor was, uh, their wages were on the decline. Like all of these things, you know, these economic factors, um, you know, are very, we're very aware of these things in platform capitalism. But I think it's really hard to talk about how that's impacted creativity. And um, I would, I don't know, I'm curious how Michael and DeForce, you would respond to that before we get into the, you know, the the specifics of geography. I mean, yeah. I think Michael, yeah, I think you kind of answered it earlier with this. I mean, and obviously with your book, with this idea of creative labor is that a lot of people just, it's classic transparency. A lot of people put all of their creative labor into their, you know, digital marketing day jobs. It's, I, I see it all the time in the music industry mm -hmm. where, or just any other industry where someone who studied graphic design or someone who like, 
study classical music their whole lives, end up becoming an A&R or becoming like a PR person. And they, you know, start thinking about it a bit differently. And a lot of this actually happens at the college level more recently, where I've noticed a lot of people who maybe ha- there's a particular person I'm thinking about, I won't name them, um, but they have like an entire classical music background, like one of those really competitive, like contralto kind of backgrounds where they like play competitive piano. And I, I think about that all the time, how they like, this person had never learned to love music as a thing unto itself. They learned, <laughs> fine. Her name is Sherry Hugh. She has a blog called Water of Music. Um, <laughs> it seems <Okay>. so. <laughs> Dang. No, she's chill. It's not the, it, but the thing is, so she kind of, pivots in college into a music business and begins and, and she runs this like substack now called water music that's pretty good that like you know actually the like kind of weighs the value of digital economies and like but it's i have to think again as a person who comes from like my grandfather owns the house and lives in the house of this guy named john t fest watley that taught sun Ra how to play the trumpet and Sun Ra's buried in the exact same like graveyard as my great grandfather. And we went to the same mm-hmm. elementary school, high school, like all this stuff. And so when I'm talking about like black nationalist like music, like I mean that shit from the bottom of my heart. Like like Gucci Mane grew up up the street for me. Like I can is it cancel or, or are you canceling it? <laughs> I think I think you canceled it before. It's no. well no. honestly. To be real, I should probably say this outright. My entire career over the last three years has just been like slaying the music industry. I'm just trying to like death star this. <laughs> I'm just sick of these people. I love it. I love it when you do it on <laughs> you literally at people. You're like, this person didn't pay me, and I'm always for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, ask our resident advisor for their rates. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, people are into this DeForest. Like, this person's like good that you name them. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing is, honestly, we're we're kind of beyond good or bad people at this point. Everyone's kind of yeah. stuck in, in like the monopoly pot and either stolen too much music or worked at a company <laughs> that right about. I mean, anybody working at a magazine right now should be fired. If you go to their like, if you go to Pitchfork right now, the content's slower than it's ever been. There were like you have all this Bandcamp music, all the SoundCloud music coming out, and they're not even taking the time to like. Wait, there's so many people what is this saying? I just played a Rolling Stone live stream Twitch and they didn't even pay us and I was one inch from calling them out on air. I'm oh, a yeah. hired gun, so I didn't do it out of respect at all. Wait, oh, no. who I, is this? I'm who staying. is this? I wanna know who this yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. This I'm gonna keep your left. You wanna know who this is? Like call them out. Like they these I people call. See my whole business strategy. Okay, we're gonna call them out for you. Yeah. Now my whole business strategy in the platform age is blackmail. Like I wrote an essay in between pla- how platform capitalism value the music industry and social music called how the dance music industry failed black artists. And it happened because I saw that Mix Mag had decided that they were going to do a blackout issue because, you know, George Floyd was murdered and everybody was feeling bad last year. And they fired me after six months because I wasn't a cultural fit, mostly because I kept talking about Detroit techno, which they stole. And I had historical marks to like prove it within their magazine. But anyway, basically I like emailed them was like, look, I will air you out and I will air out these like tax documents that I kind of already put into platform capitalism. If you don't publish this like manifesto, they were very nice about it. It came out. And, um, every, every nice solution. Yeah, I think this is the solution for all the problems within the platform capitalism well, music right now. Well, I should say this. We have to think about the fact that a lot of these companies aren't fully developed companies. They're startups. Like they're yeah. not and like there was a point where people could have sued Pitchfork for paying fifty dollars an article back in like two thousand ten and they didn't. They could have sued Vice before, you know, like they, the Fader, God, so much stuff happened at the Fader. And there's a there's a person in Emily Freelander right now who I'm like, I don't know why you haven't sued the Fader and the Vice and you're you've crossed the picket line so many times I can't even count. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> it just okay. excuse me, rant over. <laughs> 
Well, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's so many of these, like, just to be on commenting, so many of these uh, yeah. mechanisms of control operate off the fact that, like, people will not say anything. So anytime they do that, say it. Like, say who it is and say what happened yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to veer it back, because um, I want to mm -hmm. bring something else that we brought up before we have a larger discussion. Um, that we were talking about like different points in the internet and at different times. We were talking about like the blog era. We were talking about all these other eras. And I was talking in particular about like using Last FM and that being sort of a vehicle for a lot of punk artists that maybe like played in the 80s and 90s and were not even big to come back and have a resurgence through this, I guess, that um, vehicle. Maybe because it was half social media and like music. But if we look at these these spaces and spaces in the internet, if there are times that there has been more connectivity to media and to each other, are there ways in which we can get to that or explore the internet in a way that can be more um, useful given all of your accounts? That's both for Michael and for Tor. Also, yeah, Rip Tiny Mix Media. Yeah. I mean, if. Uh, I don't want to say if anyone else has anything else to say, but like, I think, I think like this thing about like different platforms offer different opportunities. I think that was like something that I was trying to get at when I was saying like, there's a different kind of like structure to expression or creativity or whatever it is that you have on, on particular platforms. So like YouTube offers certain kind of affordances that like last FM doesn't and vice versa. And so like, I think, like these spaces it's like a combination of like what the platform allows or like what it affords and what people end up using it for right like so um i don't know if that kind of gets at what you're getting at but it's like it strikes me as like that social component and that touring kind of component of like a last fm kind of offer different like vectors for people to kind of operate within that maybe like a like a uh, SoundCloud or something like that doesn't really, or or certainly a Spotify doesn't. Well, in that I'm saying like there's there seems to be a point in time when people had to be more engaged because of I guess what you're saying that the platforms were operating differently. Like Last FM and the way that its platform is structured is not anything like Spotify or any of the other platforms that we have now because now we moved to different streaming. But Last FM did have the ability to stream and preview, but it also had the ability to talk to people. Um, and you could also see some people were going to tour, and you would get like related artists, all the other things. Um, yeah. So it's just kind of like, is it all of the internet? Is it the particular platforms? Is it, um, you know, where, where do we find the more opening aspects that can maybe bring us to like more connectivity? You know, this is actually one of the things I pointed out about Resident Advisor in the Platform Capitalism article is that they've taken the model that you've two have kind of like outlined and over the last, since they started like their kind of, I guess, event page, they created a, a, a kind of a weird monopoly where you get, again, get the reviews of, the, of what tracks are good. You get reviews of like what instruments or like DJ, decks or CDJ decks or whatever are good. And then what there's like all these reviews of like venues and there's a weird monopoly that's happening of the entire industry on one side, which I mean, thanks to COVID, they've kind of lost that grip and it's like, whatever. But no, I mean, it really seems like everything that worked about the music industry about 10 years ago has just been completely bound up in how to get more clicks. Um, and again, I mean, the only thing I can think to say to get out of that is to, I wouldn't say to stop going to these websites, but it's to maybe just do the searching oneself. Because like, also rest in peace, tiny mixtapes, that's where I got started, but also like a lot of my nationalist behavior there, but whatever. Anyway, um, <laughs> there, um, no, it's, um, now that places like Stereo Gum are independent, now that Tiny Mixtapes is kind of like folded out of the way, which has allowed, kind of cut off a lot of amateur journalists from getting into the industry, which is, I mean, Tiny Mixtapes is kind of a leap, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Like a lily pad uh, for getting into journalism. Now that Stereo Gum is independent, I mean, there's new possibilities, but it, 
but can these companies and can the workers who've been inside of this platform capitalism industry for the last 10 years unlearn the patterns of just selling people music? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not fully sure that that's possible just based on kind of the conversations I've had in offices and like, obviously as people, as 70% of like music journalists were getting like laid off over the last three years, everyone I know just kind of like pivoted to a sub stack or just like went home and became a waitress yeah. or whatever, or waiter. And I don't know, it's kind of goes yeah. back to what you're saying, speak up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I wonder, so oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay, I was just gonna go um, mention in your social music essay, how you use the metaphor of the Ouroboros to like talk about this um, endless unsatisfactory growth and consumption that has monopolized um, music distribution and ownership. And um, yeah, like thinking about modalities that can get out of that, like like you said, um, speaking up against it, like earlier you talked about, um, you know, revert, diverting from Spotify to Bandcamp and there's like union of music musicians and allied workers, which is really awesome for musicians getting um, like fair treatment with, um, with like, these like relationships, economic relationships. And um, I wanted to, I would love for you to expand. You said an alternative was considering selflessness and care as a functional art mm -hmm. alternative. And I was curious um, That's what you meant by that. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I went on that little rant about like, you know, all the music that I grew up around and, and feel like I participate in. Like I spent the last, again, like decade or whatever in music journalism because I didn't want to become a musician because I didn't want to clog up the space, but also take away from all these brilliant musicians that were coming up in the late 2000s. Um, like I wanted to see yeah. them develop in a yeah. kind of yeah, inside space. Yeah, it's crazy that the even thought like clog up the space is even there to begin with, you know? Yeah, it. I mean, there are so many artists that I, I just wanted to see them grow. Like I wanted to see Laurel Halo become the next like Joni Mitchell. I wanted to see, um, I don't know why I thought like Andy Stodd. His career was kind of over by the time he like blew up again. But anywho, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but I'll, yeah. But basically, like with Make Techno Black again, do what? We're gonna you're gonna put us on any thoughts uh, shit list too. <laughs> I'm on so many shit lists. Like let's go. Like <laughs> because I don't know it. You, let's go back to this. Everyone is canceled in capitalism. I love this comment. <laughs> well, actually, yes. Yes, actually, and that's kind of why I feel okay calling people out because everyone knows what they did. And the thing is, I was probably one of the lowest paid, <laughs> worst treated people in the entire industry, and any name I've mentioned, they know. And so it's kind of a thing of like, yeah, everyone is canceled in capitalism. Everyone touched the blood money, and they, they danced in it. They played in it. They listened to Michael Jackson in it. They loved it. And... <laughs> <laughs> so it's, oh my god so good I, okay i should say this i bring up michael jackson because of uh the beatles buying little richards like masters and stealing a sound and then michael jackson buying all of their masters and then michael jackson dying and then apple yeah. getting the beatles masters yeah. and releasing oh it to the god. world in 2008 I yeah i forgot about that that yeah yeah oh my god yeah. speaking of canceled um first the opposite of canceled is that michael was actually i don't know if you guys heard this part in the book, but he was an unpaid intern. The only way to do his ethno ethnographic work he is he had to be an unpaid intern. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that I was, was like, like the that easiest way to get access. And yeah, I was like, oh, my God, like to do academic work on what's happening. You literally have to be an unpaid intern. Like you can't, you can't enter these spaces unless you're completely exploited by them. First That's of all, so they even study them. It's so ironic because you're looking into the exploitation of these workers who like were doing something because of the enchantment of, oh well, I want to do this, so it's okay that I'm being like right. manipulated. Yeah. And then meanwhile, yeah. you are this unpaid intern to, like, but I think while that researching this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's a good point. But I think like also like that provides, I think like a unique entry into like uh, like if you're there with them like as i was and like i'm like wow yeah i'm kind of like into this too and i'm like a marxist sociologist that should like know better <laughs> right like it's like whoa wait what's what's going on like there's something about the doing of this stuff that that feels that way like i don't know how we're doing for time but like i had something that i kind of wanted to build on um what deforest was saying and, yep. and what you all were saying yeah. real quick and like i was just thinking like this idea of like building relationships or like consideration or like selflessness or care like that immediately brought 
to mind like the best ideas of what people used to say like with a like a scene right like a music scene is like this sort of i mean like oh, yeah. sure there's like infighting and like combativeness and competition or whatever but there's also like a certain amount of like care a lot of which often goes like unrecognized by the people who are most most willing to provide those things but like yeah. just like but but there's also a certain like community right and i think that gets lost when everything becomes like atomized i mean even like some of the work that i did like i remember interviewing someone in the midwest and he was like he was like oh are you talking to anyone else out in my area he was like in the middle of nowhere <laughs> right like like an hour outside of like a city in michigan that's not detroit right like just like and you're like definitely nowhere. not and yeah, and like, and I'm like, I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna drive over like, you know, 30 minutes away and there's someone else that I'm talking to today yeah, and then I'm going to Detroit tomorrow or whatever. And he's like, oh, wow. Oh, you know, like I knew where people were, like that there were other people more than he did. And he's like very atomized as opposed to like mm. a, a music scene or something like that, or like a writer scene or like things that have existed historically. And, but like, I was also thinking like, like the other thing is yeah there's platforms and we could design new and better platforms and there could be worker owned platforms and there's people talking about that but the other thing is like there could be other institutions or other kinds of collectivities that develop new things that people pursue in addition to views like we've had that historically in the arts with like the development of um however problematic they are like awards right like that are the industry or a community saying this is what we deem worthy of celebration and those are all always shot through with issues of of race class and gender as we've seen like over the last decade with the like you know oscar so white kind of campaigns and, and things like that but but at the same time but that doesn't mean that there can't be new institutions that are formed <laughs> that are more equitable that are serve the needs of whoever it is that is developing them. And like, I think like that's something that could be done in music, in content creation or whatever that I've yet to see, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. And I think that gets at this issue that we were talking about, like how do we create these new spaces that aren't just about chasing views or streams, right? And it's like, there has to be like movements or coalition building towards developing something that is is better than that whether it's like community yeah. and care or just different ways of valuing cultural work or cultural products right different different ways of establishing like this is important and worth paying for not just because it's super popular and has people getting into fights and arguments but because it's interesting because it makes you dance because it you know provides something uh, uh like social value as opposed to just a quantitative metric you know um yeah. so I, I don't i don't have a plan for that but that that seems to be like what that's what yeah. i heard when you were saying that and i was like yeah that's like the social angle it, that ironically social media does not provide at all right well, yeah I see when we bring up like engagement and stuff earlier if I'm talking about it, I don't mean like uh, clicks or whatever like that. Yeah. That's still within like the economy or whatever. I meant like like literally like how do we get like yeah. audiences to come back to like engage with art? Yeah. yeah. Um and it's like the more I had just brought up last time because it seemed like more community based, like than like giving the artists and stuff all these places it doesn't really based off of that. I also I guess think of a little bit more um, platforms, but you don't, those are the ones that tend to constantly have economic issues and tend not to be able to make money. Um, sorry, I don't know how to fix that. Have my echo? Am I here? Are you good? Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't hear part of what you said, Alex. Okay, yeah, no, I was trying to speak over my own. Account. Anyway, what I was trying to say was that uh, there are these like sites that we have, and I guess I brought up lots of them, but I also brought up like Twitter, uh, sorry, not Twitter, Tumblr, that are seem to be more community based. Yeah. But those ones totally. tend to have big issues making money or seeing last of them got bought out by somebody. And so Twitter, is, uh, sorry, Tumblr has also changed hands a couple times for that reason. So it's also like, yeah, like our question is, or our issues are outside of capitalism. Like they're about capitalism in a sense. Yeah. So mm -hmm. be like yeah mm -hmm. Running up at a contradiction then, because can we even create sites that are like just going to give us this engagement outside of that? I think it's really 
Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I was just gonna say, I think it's really tricky because as we come up with like emancipatory um, modalities and adapt these modalities, capitalism adapts like around them. And which is something that uh, Michael, you speak a lot in your book about how the um, aesthetic enchantment has this illusory effect um, because, you know, while people think it's in their own creative liberty and agency, it is that same, um, aesthetic enchantment is used against people. You know, it's like taking what these interests are and being and and um, exploiting that. Um, so, um, what I was going to say was, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, oh, well, so you're wondering about the intervention of the aesthetic enchantment. Phase. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to bring it back to what you were saying about community and, um, you know breaking out of this aesthetic enchantment or this, you know, like um, order of knowledge or episteme that we're in, it takes like, like, um, like Sylvia Winter would say, just a complete like mutability of the knowledge or like rewriting of the knowledge. And um, with this uh, community approach, I think that can be a lot of infiltrating like social norms at that level of like redefining a lot of what we accept as okay and the language that we use around um around you know our own like agency and and things like this sure yeah i mean yeah i would i, I would agree right like it's it's about like providing rewards for people to make to engage socially like i don't know what those would be but like it's like a, establishing some sort of norm where you get some sort of positive reinforcement for for making you know music that's maybe like socially beneficial but or or, or just or just interesting or or just but also de defining what that is right and having some sort of definition of that which is actually quite difficult um mm. but but that does kind of suggest i mean this is something i kind of mentioned in the conclusion like like a potential kind of politics of uh, of judgment or like coming up with workers or cultural producers kind of defining what is worth pursuing or worth doing and that th that is a potential place in which you could get different kinds of cultural workers whether it's content producers or musicians or uh, heck even the people in charge of ai at google who talk about ethics which is a kind of judgment right like they all have this interest in having control over what what is valued or what's considered value in determining the way by which that valuation is made. Um, so like, I don't, like I'm a sociologist. So like we, we as, as I was told years ago, we're good at diagnosing and not at, at, at um, uh, making recommendations or predictions. <laughs> um, so like, I don't know how that, I would leave that up to people, but I think like that's that, I think you're absolutely right. Like having some center intervention or some sort of like social mechanism that reinforces what we would find desirable mm -hmm. is super important like and that's totally. yeah it's funny you bring this up because like this is kind of everything i've been trying to do with this book i've been working on and that's coming out of sibling a black counterculture which is like honing in on a particular intellectual property that has gotten kind of turned out by like a, a, another smaller music industry in Europe than the, like the American one that doesn't actually have to deal with some of the laws, doesn't have to deal with um, really taking care of techno in any way, shape or form. And it just kind of yeah, sprawled out of control as like a alienated commodity, if you will. And it's funny, um, what I kind of have ended up doing is like using this book that I've had since I was a kid from my aunt, which your name is like on the side. But it's this book called City is the Frontier. <laughs> yeah. She, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. She like studied like urban studies in college um, in sociology. And yeah, this whole book is like about Detroit. So I've been, as I've been working on like the context of techno, I've been literally like building the city like kind of around the characters. And it, it's really interesting some of the stuff that would happen around the same time, for example, when underground resistance is. Um, message to the majors where they have the track fuck the majors um came out in like 1992 it was dedicated to malice green who was beaten with a steel like 
flashlight by the Detroit police and killed. But at the same time, maybe it, I think it was a week after that record came out, this dude that's like, I can't remember his name, but he's like this huge white nationalist actually died on the, like about a week after that release came out. Um, and he's maybe 30 minutes, minutes outside of Detroit. And so within like a paragraph, I was able to kind of wrap up this whole history of like police brutality, white nationalists kind of like baiting, but also kind of bubbling like outside of the city of Detroit while also showing like underground resistance as this like distress signal and beacon of light from the city. And it, this happens like several times throughout the book where I also try to show, for example, that Detroit has a near pretty much like a hundred, yeah, a hundred year long at this point, like music scene that is responsible for a lot of like the great musicians and records of our time with like Alice Coltrane being from there and like Miles Davis playing in the blue, was it Bluebird Inn? And, but yeah, I, I basically say that, that Detroit music is like a hundred years of continuous thought that's been broken up by two different moments of kind of racial violence. So oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, you have like this highway that's run through the neighborhoods of Paradise Valley and Black Bottom, which is where the primarily black like jazz scenes were. And like this highway is just like built there purposely to disrupt the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so that scene goes away and then it's replaced with Motown. Then the 67 riots happen and Motown, you know, skips town and goes to LA where they produce, you know, what's going on and inner visions and all the great like Motown records. Um, and techno was just kind of like, just there in the rubble of both the city of Detroit and and like Motown Records. And I tell people all the time that there is this, there is a alternate reality where one Atkins, Derek Bay and Kevin Saunderson and all of them were in underground resistance were, were all signed to Motown. And actually mm -hmm. Mad Mike from underground resistance did have a band signed on Motown. It was like working with George Clinton in Parliament Funkadelic. So there's all of these like, beautiful threads and stories that kind of exist only within like, yeah, the microcosm of the scene, if you like look hard enough. And perhaps that's something that needs to be done across the board. It's just like deep analyses of like the lives of music. Yeah, it's interesting because you talk about how the backdrop drop of Detroit played kind of like a um, huge role in shaping these, these, these cultural outputs. And there is this uh, Turkish Nobel laureate of literature. I think it was Pamuk, I think is his name. Um, I saw him speak at Harvard and he was talking about how uh, when, he, when he writes, he's always thinking about the story with the backdrop of Istanbul. And there, you know, I feel like Michael would just like love this kind of like idea of like the urban studies background of like how the social and the geographical are shaping you know, the backdrop of, in your case, you know, you're talking about Detroit. Um, but I think there's something shared internationally where like our geographies are definitely, you know, playing a role in how we're kind of filtering culture. And, you know, one of the things I was gonna say about like, you know, we've been talking about platform capitalism and, and just cultural industries. Like the thing that I'm kind of curious about though, is that like, like how, how do like the multiple temporalities, you know, this is the biggest critique of, you know, people talking about technology all the time. Like how do the multiple temporalities play in? Like we, we talk about the Amish and Pennsylvania and we talk about like the indigenous, you know, um, the people that are no, that in no re regard involved in neoliberalism. Um, and then you have cities where people are living in the future, basically, and that's what we're talking about. So we're talking from this futurist per position, even though we're talking about the present. Um, like how, like how do these, like how is this like ecosystem? I'm I'm using DeForest's conception here. He talks about the musical ecosystem. Um, how is this playing into like the future of other temporalities? Would you say? I don't know if that's even a good question. I'm just thinking about that as we we're talking about um, Detroit in all of these different places, you know? I can say this briefly, that part of why I chose techno is because it's the central property of the electronic dance music industry, which I consider to be, as I said earlier, like a sort of little leagues or minor leagues of the American uh, and global uh, music industry. And by mm -hmm. removing 
were techno, suddenly there's this thing called the hardcore continuum in like UK dance music where they take like techno at 140 and house music at, or at 140 BPM and house music at 120 BPM, footwork at about 160 and drum and bass at about like 180, 190 and like hip hop at about 80. And like, yeah, you just kind of move along this like timeline of beats to determine what the genre is. But Juan Atkins was playing like a Korg MS-10 hooked up, or not even hooked up to a Roland 808 that was going straight into like a four track mixer. Like none of these Detroit dudes were thinking about a BPM. So when I tell people that Juan Atkins was actually trying to make, you know, Herbie Hancock style, like jazz fusion, you know, with the hint of like Parliament Funkadelic, like, you know, psychedelic soul, that removes this whole timeline, this like time structure or maybe I should say time constrictor that the UK dance like music industry has put on techno. It like the wow. hope is to literally take it out and then watch the industry either collapse under its own bullshit or sort of deal with other types of music uh, sit, like sitting around it. And I'll use the example of a uh, Caduro music from Portugal with uh, the group uh, Principe. They have a completely indigenous to them like style of dance music that can that can completely sway the way dance music has been thought of from like being the four on the floor boom 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 beat there is no dance music that has ever tried to do four on the floor frankie knuckles did the four on the floor because he was using a drum like literally a metronome for his early tracks and got mm. his first drum machine from derek may who sold it to him for juan atkins like about <laughs> five years after juan atkins made techno so house music is like a direct response to the geographical relationship between Detroit and Chicago and this like selling. Oh, and, wow. Like, and that's mind blowing. Yeah, that's yeah, really and, mind blowing. That's crazy. And that's the thing. If I remove those things, suddenly what happens to like, you know, the European burner scene, what happens to that peace, love, you know, and revolution scene of Berlin or the UK or whatever, they're just left with, Honestly, this kind of weird gap between Joy Division, Kraftwerk, and mm -hmm. then like whatever they're calling dance music now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's like a really interesting move. Sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, yes, no. chess. There was, there was a question that I was gonna ask you before, but then I, I did it during the, during the <laughs> But um, <laughs> we're, because I was thinking a lot about, yeah, like early formation of hip hop and like some early turntablists and stuff like talking about getting equipment from the riots, like when the riots happened in stuff in New York, like being able to have access to the, these things. Um, and also what you're talking about in terms of like re-territorialization and deterritorialization of capitalism, maybe like these flows. I go through that. I think you can kind of talk about that in terms of the black subject. I think that's sometimes helpful, or could be helpful in terms of the history of thinking about music and, and particularly electronic music, um, and not sure. just like like music that uses electronic equipment. Yeah, that makes the instruments talk. That's kind of the difference. Like, are you like literally possessing the instrument with voodoo magic, or are you, you know, plugging beats into place in Ableton? That's that's kind of the difference I'm finding. Well, I guess Richie Hodden would kind of make beats in a row, but also Richie Hodden kind of stalked the Bellevue 3 and like learned all of their gear and then sold it as a standard. So, yeah. yeah. That's really, I was gonna say that's like a really fascinating move. And I think both, both you and Alex just did, right? Which is like, is like taking this thing where like, it's totally, I mean, you just, I never really thought you just, I'm just saying you just blew my mind a little bit. Just thinking about how like dance music and the European like BPM thing is like basically taking this thing that might not have been thought of in those terms and kind of to use like, it's it's kind of inscribing it within this kind of like, I would say kind of European tradition of like, oh, it needs to be mapped. It needs to be, what's the BPM? What key is it in? All these sorts mm -hmm. of things. And it like, it, it makes it part of that. And what I, it sounds like you're doing, which is like kind of, yeah, really sounds really awesome. Is like actually saying like, well, no, it's, it's part of this other tradition that is not part of that. And also, and kind of decentering that 
tradition as it's taken off in in Europe. That sounds really cool. Like, yeah, you you need to finish the book so I can. <laughs> it's <laughs> it gets gritty. It's I mean, but that, I started making music for this reason mostly because like I been in the music industry for way too long to get another job after having been like a truck driver um, before I moved to New York. So it's one of those things where I was like, okay, I have to make this music thing work. So maybe if I, as a journalist or as like an insider trader, trader kind of like jump over to the music side and show them what techno is. Maybe I, cause like when I play my beats or whatever, I, Alex has seen it, I play with my fingers. Like it's all live with my hands. And like, there's like literal like haptic sound design that's kind of happening through an iPad. And then later, like maybe sometimes run live through Ableton as like a unlimited, like tr unlimited track mixer. So you get this like crazy stereophonic live drumming thing that's a bit more free jazz than what one Atkins maybe could have come up with in 1980 when MIDI didn't exist. But, you know, which I can go into a whole thing about the guy that invented MIDI and how that's uh, another thing that. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I mean. Talk about how you talk about like um, European, like the Euro European or maybe like more Western tradition trying to recoup, I guess, the narrative from um, other bodies that create things under capitalism is um, I think that sometimes they try to do it in subtle ways with hip hop. I guess you brought up earlier, um, sorry, try not to echo, the uh, coverage of hip hop. And I think of the uh, latest Young Lean documentary, which like super pissed me off. Like, I don't know, I guess we'll call it everybody. Cause it was like two hours long on Vice. I don't know if anybody saw that. It was like a two hour long Young Lean documentary and they decided to do that. And I feel like that is almost Trump's in length. Almost all hip hop documentaries that I've seen them do. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like the Little B one, they, like Little B one they did, that was like 15 minutes or something like that. And I feel like it's like, they're not necessarily trying to say, this is what you should listen to, but it's like this European like guy who listens to- Did they have that one kid? Who they like, usually like, send to hang out? There's like one kid, sorry to interrupt. There's oh, like no, no, one no, dude that they always send. Terrible, no. Ter yeah. Oh yeah, I, like with the glasses and everything, terrible. Yeah, terrible. We'll totally. call him out. <laughs> <laughs> but, Whatever his um, name is, like you. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not covering that. Like, uh, no, and I think that there's like a subtle way of saying like, oh, this is more elevated or more interesting than like these other people that make this music. Because if you watch the documentary, honestly, nothing really happened. I mean, there's nothing really to, like say. Like, I don't know. That's all I had to say. I had to rant about that documentary. It annoyed me. <laughs> I unmute it just to laugh really quick so that you all can hear me. I'm muting it again. I don't know. I mean, it just maybe because we're in like a leftist forum, I should say this. If anyone wants to know what reparations looks like, this is what it's going to look like if you don't give it the normal way. We will come and take it. I promise. Like, it's um my, like, yeah, it just... Yeah, I mean, I had this conversation with someone recently about electronic music and how Kei Trinata just won, was the first black person to win the Grammy for electronic dance music as of a few months ago, or I guess a week ago, a few weeks ago. And um, and I wasn't that bothered by it because, you know, they opened that category in 2005. So it's like, you know, if it took the Grammys that long to recognize that there's people making music with electronic devices, and there's a multi-million dollar industry over in Europe that's just like churning out Dutch dudes making like boom booms or whatever. It's I don't know. I guess that's their problem, but I don't I don't know. It's um yeah. This like, is what were we're, you gonna yeah. Say, were you gonna say something earlier, Michael? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. But yeah, other than like, yeah, I don't know. Right on. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Right like, on. I think this is probably a good start for a uh, good time for us to start wrapping up. Yeah, about all of the links are in the chat for uh, Michael's book, DeForest's music, and essay and book.
I'll find that. Yeah, we'll make sure to post um, a lot of these links on Facebook and Instagram um, for anyone listening. Uh, thanks for everyone listening. It looks like we got one of the highest turnouts for the show that we've ever got. Um, Thank goodness. We need a high for all the cards. <laughs> And it was, I think it's just because it was Alex's birthday. Hell yeah. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> I think these are just all of Alex's friends. Yeah. They all mean is <laughs> That would be my guess. <laughs> she said, you have to come out for my birthday. And they knew that she would get upset otherwise. So here they are. So thanks for all of Speaking Alex's about, friends for yeah, coming and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, yeah, uh, so we just had some things drop recently. We had uh, DeForest. You just dropped a song like yesterday, right? Oh, or did shit, you just yeah. post a song? You stay doing that. I gotta make money. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, I dropped a track on Tresor, which was kind of another funny chess move for the dance music journalists that tried to ignore me um, in this <laughs> campaign. <laughs> it's just like, look. <laughs> Let me go over here to the official techno label and write the uh, techno track at the end of techno. Um, oh my God, I love it. So I don't know. Maybe one day I'll get a Grammy. We're going to get a Grammy, don't you worry. <laughs> no, I don't even know if that's possible. I don't want to get into that. I don't but think it's, so. It's never been that open to get a Grammy, right? It's always been like the same. Right, Michael? Yeah, you're I, like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's literally why Kanye is running on stage grabbing awards. He's like, I want one. <laughs> Just give me one. We're like, Kanye, you have a mountain, but he's like, I want one award. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I think they're, they're like the people who vote on those, like the Academy or whatever. It's not the Academy, whatever the association is, like, are, are no, notoriously pretty conservative in yeah. terms of taste. I mean, and I think you can see that in the kinds of people that, that win. They don't, really take any risks you know definitely like i think in the early 90s like aerosmith was winning like best heavy metal award you know i mean like that tells you something like it's they're not a metal band you know <laughs> um so for, for some now, reason, like you translate that to now it's like um oddly enough man strangely enough like this guy that played drums in like a hardcore band that i used to be in was up for was in a band that was nominated for a Grammy this year. What and band it was, was like it? Uh, Black Pumas. Oh, whoa. That's Wait, really? The drummer, I mean, it's it's like the, the two, the guitar player and the singer are kind of the main people in that group, but the drummer who's on the records and toured was, yeah, it was in like a punk band with me like years ago and kind of a screamo-y hardcore band um, like in the early 2000s, which is just wild. He's, I mean, phenomenal drummer, way better than I was a, bass player guitar player <laughs> yeah but that's crazy how things how things turn out like that um yeah yeah those people i mean those people aren't you know they're part of the problem so we obviously are just saying that is like a we're like ironic posting when you're saying yeah. like we want we want all the grammys or whatever but i mean i you know and when connie like grabs awards that's kind of tight in that sense right it's like steve mcqueen because he's, he's oh really yeah, after he won Best Picture for 12 Years a Slave, he, like, grabbed somebody's, like, award and was like, that's mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like, it was at the after party. And I was like... Oh, my shit. God. Like oh, my God. But also, like, also, like, can I talk to you, Michael, about how you talk... You don't say this, but, like, if you weren't a sociologist and you were, like, on the political side and you're doing what I do, like, create propaganda, you would say, like, that, like, all of these people, like that are part of these like uh you know these like like these like basically influence influencer managers or whatever yeah when they're looking for artists like when you talked about the children do you remember that part yeah it, it's like that is so problematic like they're looking like they're looking to take advantage of like children influencers because um they are kids passive. just watch on repeat. They'll just say, yeah, I don't know if you have like and repeat kids users. Or a it's like basically or niece like or something, but that's how they watch. Yeah. It's like the same people that like wanted kids to smoke back in the day yeah. because they would be like such an easy yeah. group of people to get hooked. These are so yeah. spongy and programmable. And then somebody yeah. somebody in the book says like that 
children's YouTube is, I, I got the quote somewhere, but it's something like, I, oh my God, it's like something like, it's a, it's an automated hellscape. To oh yeah, that's a like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, I mean, because there was a lot of a moral panic like about four, three, three to five years ago around that. And there's a lot of news articles where they describe, I think that's like an NPR headline or something like that. That's crazy. Um, like, why but, didn't I hear about this? But it's just like, basically like, like these companies, like YouTube is already like, kind of like endangering to the children, I guess. I don't know what that means. I don't know if there's like a moral position there I'm not going to sign off on. No, I mean, but I think, I think but there there's is, like this. Like, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I, I don't know well, if, if you're getting to like a question or you just wanted to speak on that. I, I, no, like, just talk to that. Cause yeah. I just, there's just something that no one's ever talked about. I mean, like I have nephews and nieces that like watch stuff and I'll, it'll be like a ladybug that looks like they're like doing naughty things. And I'm like, what are you watching? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, it is like this bizarre part of YouTube where I get traumatized seeing it. It's like, what is, is that ladybug having sex with a rhinoceros? Like, what? Seriously, what is happening? Yeah. Like, is this supposed to be like inducing like some kind of like acid like state for kids? Like, what? Like, seriously, like some of this stuff is like insane. Some of it, I mean, it ranges from just like totally benign kind of like people like yeah. like like cheap animations of like nursery rhymes that are cranked out yeah. by people all over the world seemingly, and um, and then there's these really strange things. Yeah. I mean, so, so like part of my field work when I was doing research for the book was just like watching thousands of YouTube videos, like combing through lists of channels. And yeah, trying to come up, right? yeah, and like trying to come up, trying to figure out which ones would be possibly valuable to to sign to like a management contract, and like um, some of them were quite bizarre, and some of them were like, yeah, these children's channels, which are like highly profitable, but a lot of the more questionable content that falls in that, which would be really attractive to kids like some of the stuff uh matthew was just describing where it's like sexually suggestive or maybe it like uses like characters from frozen but in some sort of like questionable way yeah, um, really. like, uh, uh, like yeah some it ranges from just like being really violent to being like sexually suggestive in different ways a lot of that like wouldn't be profitable to like a like like a <laughs> intermediary organization because it'll get demonetized by the platform right and i don't think there's like a moral judgment and then saying like we couldn't s like sign them or work with them or something like that but there's a there's an economic reason not to because you can't but the thing i got from the stuff. book was that but the thing that i got from the book is that they would do that if there if they was could. Some yeah kind if there was capital... Yeah. Like if there was some yeah. capital gain from that, they would totally be into that. And that's the yeah. thing that gets really kind of yeah. creaky when you think about the children, like that well, these companies. Think about it though, with like, with like YouTube and some of these other platforms, they didn't really start cracking down on content of any kind right. until yes. the advertisers started to leave. So until yeah. there was an economic yeah. reason, they didn't care. Right, and there because the thing that used to be there was like the Ninja Turtle Sex Museum. There was like this video that kids were watching for a while. It was called like the Ninja Turtle Sex Museum. It's basically like Ninja Turtles. I think there I don't remember it, but I remember being at this music festival and I was like hanging out with my partner at the time. This guy just comes up and shows us this YouTube video. And it's just like this like pornograph I think it's like a pornographic scene of like but not like fully pornographic, but something that was on YouTube of like Ninja Turtles like about to do it or something, something weird like that. I don't remember the specifics, but things like that were like, how is this on YouTube? But there was like a, you're right. There's like a point at yeah, where like I mean, some of the stuff wasn't get, being kicked off. Can get really dark really quick. Um, but there was like the thing, I think it was like 2017, I want to say, or 2018 where they call it like the adpocalypse. I might be raw, a little off on the year. Um, where there was basically like a lot of advertisers were pulling their content due to um, due to basically like it show being shown like the ads being shown on content that like you know Levi's or Coca Cola didn't want to be associated with like whether it's white nationalist content or some of these more 
um, questionable things that you mentioned. And it, but it really wasn't until then that anything was 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 done. And um, and so, like, I think, that, like, you're right. If you take away the idea that, like, they're not going to, they they they'll go after whatever gets the most views. Like, it doesn't really matter unless there's like an economic disincentive to do so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it the internet's kind of dark in that way or kind of grim you know it's it's really it's great for, it's a really it's a, a vector for a lot of the the stuff that i think like alex was bringing up like neoliberalism or uh yeah um as a thing like it's really like a, a a vector for for that way of thinking about things like everything is just an economic um it's valued for its economic reasons and and not much else right um so i don't know yeah but i, I think um I'm, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> and on that great note, <laughs> we're to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, oh. we should wrap up on a positive-ish note. Oh, I know it's really? been like That's a positive a pessimistic <laughs> conversation. Sorry, say no, that again, Alex. I was saying the positive note is it's my birthday. And yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> Congrats. Matthew is coming to the East Coast soon. That's the other positive note, right? Mm -hmm. so, yep. Sorry to call New you York. out. When is this happening? <laughs> it's in the. I'm I'm coming to New York in the fall, so we'll oh, be hanging out. Yeah. Uh, before and moving? before that up is escaping and becoming an ex expat. So yeah, got to get out of Where here. Where are you going? The Toronto for now. Oh, nice, nice. I'm it's just. It's I a quick hideout. Yeah, come visit and then I'll escape to Antarctica or something. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have lots of friends in Toronto, so we'll come and oh, see you. I thought you were gonna say Antarctica. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no. Come to Toronto. <laughs> yes. Or I'll yes, still be in New York, that. maybe. <laughs> and then and then Michael will probably be in Canada soon too, huh? I think I'll be back there in the fall. It looks like, yeah, I'll be because I did you teach at Queen's I teach University? In, yeah, Kingston. It's like two and a half oh, hours yeah, east yeah. of Toronto. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. So oh, that's perfect. We'll have a hangout. Yeah. In Toronto. Yeah. So well, to awesome. Well, on a positive note, um, be aware of creative control and aesthetic enchantment in the workplace. Buy music from artists <laughs> and on Bandcamp, and um, and. And it's Alex's birthday, and <laughs> and yeah. divorce is just going to be throwing so much stuff at you before you and even know all it. So. Out, all of the shit happening within uh, neoliberal platform capitalism constantly, yeah. especially Rolling Stone, according to Shove three eight nine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all Rolling Stone. I found out who that was, by the way. So oh. it is legit comment. Anyways, yeah, thank you, everyone. We will we will see you all soon and happy birthday to Alex and, uh, and happy birthday. Happy birthday, Alex. Happy birthday. Uh, I love y'all so much. Love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a right. I'm sorry. As you could be on your birthday, it's all good. Okay, thanks for joining us, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.